what time? Well, what time is it over there? Is it really early in the morning right now? Uh, yeah, it's just gone seven. Okay, so so for the people watching us, Paul and I are gonna design together a real world software, right, Paul? Is that what we're gonna do? Yeah. So <clears throat> you've been talking a lot about. Um, the standard and lake houses and cul-de-sac patterns and things like that and um i've noticed that there are a lot of real world problems out there that might not necessarily <coughs> fit in terms of like you know the ideals that you potentially have in terms of what you want from code so i thought well i've got this system um it's inherently very complex and it's made up of lots of moving parts. But if we could take one of the more complex pieces of it and look at what that does and potentially break that down, there might be some opportunity here for both myself and the wider community to, to learn something interesting about potentially how we could write good code from code that is inherently complex, not because um, it was written badly, but because the system is just inherently complex. Um, and this is a problem that um, we often get companies come to us and say, hey, we, you know, and when I say companies, I'm talking about like minor, massive financial institutions are, are coming to us and saying, hey, we've thrown millions at this and we just know it's difficult um, and have given up on it. So we'd rather buy your product. So I already have a product in the cloud that's working. Uh, um, what I'd like to do is re-engineer it so it's better. Okay. Um, and I'm hoping that off the back of that, we'll get some performance improvements and we'll remove some of the limits that the current system has. So, so, so I have a question for you. Yeah. So, 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 so <clears throat> for everyone watching us, this is how you know I love Paul so much. He's making me do something for fintech. I hate nothing in the world more than fintech. So, so sometimes, you know, just you know, people you love will make you do things <laughs> that you don't want to do. <laughs> Paul, is there a? You know, when I was recording the regular expression session, you know, my mic was actually reading from the camera. Are you able to hear me regularly, like we do in the O data sessions, or are you hearing a different noise? Just I did wonder why the it just popped like that. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you're hearing me fine now, right? The normal, yeah. regular way. Okay, so let's start from the top. This is going to be a long session, so I hope you got your uh, tea. I drink tea, too. What kind of tea do you drink, Paul? Lipton? <laughs> this is a... <laughs> Costa. Costa, Costa. Okay. Coffee. Okay, coffee. Okay. Wow, you're you're Americanized, man. What's up with the? Hmm? Okay then. I, I'm just. I would just say I'm just a developer. I mean, we, that's what we do, right? Darkened corners, coffee machine, automate it if we can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I once read a, a post about a guy that um he quit working for a company after so many years, uh -huh. and nobody really knew what he did. Um, and, they, and the dev team went through his machine. And one of the things that they found was this random blob of binary. And they were like, okay. what does this do? But it was attached to like a, a Linux command. And they mm. were just like, I'll tell you what, we'll run it. They ran it and oh, they yeah. found out that what it did was it spurted that random blob of binary over the network to the Ethernet port plugged in the back of the coffee machine. No! <laughs> which was time so that he had enough time to literally get up from his PC, walk across the room, place the cup, oh, and the genius. coffee would just, just spit out. Yeah. Oh, oh, I love that. You know, <laughs> you know, um, it's, you know, Domino's. I don't know if you have Domino's in England. I, I don't think you yeah, do. Yeah. I, I think do you have Domino's in India, England. Okay, yeah, so are everywhere, man. They, they have Amazon. <laughs> they, they have a command line now where you can order pizza through the command line. No way. I swear to God. Let me show you. I saw that the other day and I was like, you gotta be kidding me. And 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 it's true. Check this out. So so it's um so here is Domino's command line. You can actually go and install a CLI and you can order pizza with the CLI from Domino's. 
<laughs> how crazy is that? What the heck? Seriously, man, what the heck? You know, I thought like, you know, no, wait, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on. Not this one. Hold on. Let's go Domino's Pizza. Command line. Yep, from the command line. Here it is. And you go, here's the guy, and you can go into the command line, and you basically go and say, let's say, uh, set email, Bob, set service, whatever, the service that you want to order from, and then a pizza menu, drinks, you have your everything. You can order everything. Here's my toppings. Here's my product, 16-inch, you know, Excellent. everything. How crazy is that? So you, you know, can just I set up a script with a regular yep, order and once yep, a week just pop it off. <laughs> yep. Every time a de every time a successful deployment is completed to production, you buy pizza for the whole team. <laughs> <laughs> Part of standard release process. Yep. <laughs> order a pizza now. <laughs> every, time, every time I release GitHub, <laughs> webhook automatically, just order pizza for everybody. <laughs> Don't even ask, just order the pizza. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> the, the other crazy one then, is then the we one... have a pandemic and everybody works from home and 50 pizzas get ordered to a major yeah, office block just, and there's just no one flying. there it's going around <laughs> you know the, the other one is domino's order pizza via twitter so you could tweet at them and they wow. will and they will bring you the pizza you can now order domino's by tweeting that's brilliant it's called Domino's Anywhere, like not any anywhere, W A R, W A R E, anywhere, like software. I love it. Someone, <laughs> someone who's really, really smart decided to do that, you know, and just looking like, look at this, man. You know, they, they're like, you know what? You want integration? You want APIs? I got you. How cool yeah. is that? I this is what, what I love software about software. Sells, though, isn't it? If you can imagine it, you can make it happen. You know, that's all that it is. Anyway, let's just get started. Tell, tell me tell me the story about this business. You know, don't tell me about, see, see, this is the hard one. When I work with any engineer and they have an existing system, the first thing I tell them is try to detach. It's the hardest thing. Try to detach your current implementation decisions from what you're actually trying to accomplish. Yeah. That's a tough one, but give it a shot. I don't know. So, yeah, without going into the details of, like, the company that I work for and things like that, um, the key thing here is that what we're trying to do is, as you say, it is fintech, mm -hmm. um, but it's a different kind of fintech. I, I like, or I like to think of it as a different kind of fintech. So You're doing data I'm, processing. It's not really... Anyway, keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you, I kind of despise anything that makes money for the rich, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> but what we're trying to do is we're trying to take a product um, which is known as factoring. And okay. we call, um, there's an extension to that called reverse factoring. Mm -hmm. And what essentially it means is, so factoring is if you operate a big company and I operate a small company, and you buy a product from me, and mm -hmm. I don't have the money to fulfill that order, uh -huh. um, the only way that I can fulfill the order is to get paid as soon as I order the product. But in a big business world, that's not okay. how it works. Okay. Particularly when you're dealing with these like massive scale, like the Fortune 500 companies and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's common practice that they have what we call payment terms. And the payment terms will mean that me as the smaller supplier mm -hmm. for you, I'm going to get paid in probably 60 days-ish mm. for an order that I'm expected to start delivering on, say, within a week. Okay. Um, so what's going to happen is there's going to be a big wedge of manufacturing costs that I'm going to have in mm -hmm. order to fulfill your order. Mm -hmm. And then... And then nearly two months after I've spent that operating cost, I'm going to get mm -hmm. that money back with whatever my profit margin is. Mm -hmm. So I'm in this situation where if I'm regularly doing this kind of business, mm -hmm. what I'm finding is I'm running at essentially a deficit. Yeah. And so you're running yourself in debt. And can you hold your business up? until you're ready to be paid by these fortune 500s right is that what you're saying 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's always going to be like smaller orders that you can handle come in in between. But if you've got one of these big orders, you've probably spent all your operating budget on, you know, fulfilling the big order, because let's face it, you're not going to turn that order down, are you? Right, because right. Because it, it's, it's potentially it's something that could make, right? yeah. yeah, it's going to make a big difference to you. Yeah. So the way that companies have found to approach this problem is they would go to an investor or a bank and they would say, look, big Fortune 500 here um, has ordered this this stuff from us. As long as we deliver it, they are going to pay us. Mm-hmm. Um, and the bank comes in, they say, okay, we'll give you essentially the business equivalent of a payday loan. Okay. Um, now, because of what payday loans are essentially and how they work, um, they tend to have high interest rates on them. Okay. And so what you're going to find is let's say um you want a regular loan from a bank Mm -hmm. you might pay say seven eight percent interest if you want Mm -hmm. a payday loan you're probably going to pay 10 20 percent interest per annum Mm -hmm. you know even higher in some cases you know particularly those horrible vulture type loan systems Mm -hmm. but but standard factoring normally you'd pay say 10 percent Mm-hmm. Um, which means that if I've got a thousand dollar invoice, I'm immediately losing a hundred dollars of the face value of that invoice. Now, bear in mind, we're talking about big business orders here. So yep. we're not talking about hundreds of dollars. We're talking about millions or tens of millions of dollars on a single invoice. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's quite a margin to lose. Yeah. Um, so what reverse factoring does is we get the buyer, the supplier, and the finance entity or funder Mm -hmm. all involved in contracts where they've all agreed that they're going to make regular payments for regular orders because they're doing regular business with one another um, by contract. And what this does is typically... The Fortune 500 company is one of these that has these sort of AAA plus credit ratings that just like a regular person or company simply can't get. They're they're considered to be effectively so rich that there's no point in them having a credit score at all. They've they've got money. So because they're involved in the contract, Mm -hmm. from the finance entity's point of view, Mm -hmm. uh, the risk is relatively low. Because because um, the, because the funder is so rich. Sorry, so the sorry, not the funder, the buyer, the, fund, uh, the buyer, and yeah. the buyer would be would be the Fortune five hundred, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay, so this guy is the buyer talks to the funder, right, through the contract, of course, and the funder pays the supplier. Is that right? Paul? Yeah. So what's going to happen is the buyer is going to place an order with a supplier. Mm-hmm. The supplier is going to get paid by the funder, and then sixty mm-hmm. days later, the funder is going to get paid from the buyer. So, uh-huh. what's going to happen then? Because they're all involved in this shared agreement through mm-hmm. the system, mm-hmm. uh, the risk from the funder's point of view is very low That's because right. they've all agreed what the terms are, and they've all accepted that this is just a regular thing that's going to happen. So it becomes a business as usual thing and it's less risky. Mm. So from the funder's point of view, he can offer much better rates on those effective rolling payday loans. If you think Mm. about, you know, what's going to happen is there's going to be these regular orders going on. Right. And and so the net result of that is that it becomes less of a one-off situation that needs to be evaluated much like getting a loan and more of a regular day-to-day situation such as, I'm just doing a different kind of transaction here, but it's Mm -hmm. still just a regular transaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, this is the sort of product that um, historically has only been available to Fortune 500 companies. And that's if they want it, they would go to a bank and they Mm -hmm. would set up such an agreement with a bank. And there are... Banks won't do that with smaller businesses, right? Because of the credit score, right? Well, they will, but it's much harder for smaller businesses to get access to higher interest. Kind of yeah, yeah, because and, of the risk. Yeah. Well, if you consider what's actually going on here, um, what they're doing is they're leveraging that 
that high value um, from the bank's point of view. They're leveraging a high value client to make some easy money, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, because it's just pushed. It's much like short selling on the stock market, right? Oh, I can mm. make a quick buck. Um, boff. And and the banks. So the banks will go to the effort of building a system to handle that particular situation. Mm -hmm. Now. The thing with reverse factoring and the thing about what my company is trying to deliver is yeah. we're taking that a step further and we're saying, hey, what if there was a standard for how this worked? What if we could um, take a mechanism like this and turn it into a product that I can stick onto Azure, say, and... I can take that product and I can market it to any company and through the system, they could get into these relationships with these bigger companies that they're effectively already doing business with. Mm -hmm. And the system facilitates setting all of this stuff up. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the first piece of this process is figuring out, obviously, the day to day business pieces. Um, and then the second piece is obviously all of the verifications and setting up contracts and things that goes on around that. Um, yeah. So the piece that um, we're here to discuss today is that transactional piece is mm -hmm. about the act of effectively taking in um, a set of transactions, mm -hmm. um, breaking down the workload for that set of transactions into smaller chunks that we can handle to get them into the system, what we call import. Um, and then the net effect is that there are different types of transactions. Um, this is just a reality of, of how the world works. So uh, what we normally think of as a transaction is a thing that has a header. Like, a, So think of like an invoice, right? So right. think of the header as being um, the sheet of paper that contains some um, top level information, like, you know, the buyer and the supplier's information. Mm -hmm. And and what we call the face value, which is the the overall value of that whole invoice. Right. The invoice then also has some other key child items. Um, mm -hmm. So they'll have like sets of references um, and what we call line items, which is the stuff on the invoice, the things being bought and sold. Yes. Um, now, where it gets particularly complicated mm -hmm. is that because of the scale of business that's going on here, IT people have done what IT people do best. Complicate things. Yeah. And then they go and talk to companies like SAP. <laughs> because, because SAP solves the what we call the ERP problem. Um, yeah. So the ERP problem is about manufacturing process and building things and following mm -hmm. regulations and stuff like that. So... Mm -hmm. That's a thing that SAP does. But ultimately, what's happening here is there's this transactional piece that takes place in the accounting system. Then at some point, each line item on the invoice ends up being what we call a document or mm -hmm. a line item in, um, sorry, SAP refers to them as journal entries. Mm -hmm. Journal entries, yep. yep. Yeah, so what just, you're going to see... Just, just, Paul, just for the people watching, uh, ARP is Enterprise Resource Planning. Yes. Whatever, whatever is called a resource that can be employees, it can be transactions, it can be literally anything out there. That's mm -hmm. the system that plan SAP is very massive, you know, but also very complicated. I'm sorry, go ahead, Paul. I'm just trying to kind of yeah, no, and fill, it's in, good. fill in the gaps here. Mm -hmm. It's good to bear in mind that when we talk about invoices and the way people transact, there mm -hmm. tends to be a lot of legislation that prevents certain transactions taking place in certain ways. Yeah. When we're talking about journal entries and the and resources and the way people manage a thing in a system, that's, that's non-standardized. Th yeah, yeah, there's no standard for that. There's no rules for it. There's no legislation that says how you can do that because let's face it, we as software developers can build anything at any point in time and no one cares. What they as care long as about it works. Does it yeah, work? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's a proto but it's a prototype but it works i don't understand but but wait it's a prototype we need to rewrite it from scratch nope just deploy it <laughs> exactly 
So what like um, regulators and governments and things like that care about is okay. preventing things like fraud. So making sure that transactions are always legal. Okay. So what we have to care about here is the act of how they're interacting with um, the transactions and how that process of effectively buying and selling a transaction is working. Because what the funder is essentially buying, they're not buying any product. They're mm -hmm. buying zeros and ones on a paper, right? On a piece mm -hmm. of paper, mm -hmm. effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and then at a later date, they're getting paid for they the thing that they for, bought. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So in but, much uh, the but, same but way. Wait, Paul, I, I have a question for you. I'm sorry. Just, just help oh. me understand. <laughs> in this map, are we good on this map first? Because we're going to use this a lot. It, you, Your system is this contract, basically, that happens between people who are looking for funding and people who can offer funding while involving the buyer, right? Is this where your system lives? So, yeah, due, due to the legal requirements, mm -hmm. um, the contracting stuff still has to happen on paper anyway. Actual um, I, I, physical printed paper. Yeah, there have to be. So due to the way these things work legally, things mm -hmm. have to physically be signed. Now, there are um, mechanisms coming in where um, we can do like digital document signing and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And those systems are getting smarter. But companies, particularly the big companies, like if you've ever spoken to like a CFO or a Fortune 500 company, mm -hmm. their questions are always like, um, how can I ensure that your system won't have, you know, the U.S. Um, government coming down on me because I did a thing that they don't agree with? Or, right. or like, how can your system protect me from that? Or how can your system provide accurately an audit trail that makes sure that in a court of law, it's bulletproof? So I can't be held accountable for what your system does. But, so it, it has to be in a particular format and the digital format is not considered verifiable enough because digital government. data can be manipulated yeah. is the argument whereas a physical signature on a piece of paper with once a that width, piece of paper is with signature yeah. yeah yeah exactly so there's a there's a really weird gray area there so in order to avoid a lot of the complication a lot of companies still just follow the paper trail in this aspect of it mm -hmm. so the piece of the system that i thought we would focus on um is the act of managing the data itself rather than the contracts will work on the transactions. the transactions are going okay and these transactions are the ones going from fortune to funder and from funder to small supplier does the fortune ever talk to the small supplier in this system paul yeah it's it's a three-way interaction so the way that we've set up our system is there's there's kind of several models that that you can do this right. but let's let's take the the obvious kind of straightforward start point which is um an order is placed by the fortune 500 in this case so by the okay. buyer so let, let's use the terms buyer and supplier and funder okay i love that i love that i love it buyer supplier and funder okay yeah because at this point we can throw away size concerns because they don't yep. matter what it matters doesn't matter in your process. your by the way, just, just for the people watching, what Paul and his company do is actually, if you think about it, it's actually a very noble, nice thing that they do because they allow small businesses to survive in an economical system that mandates impossible conditions for some businesses to survive in terms of fulfilling big businesses. You know, just, just, just to kind of give people an example, because Paul, people watch us from, from all kinds of different backgrounds and all kind of different places. So I have to simplify things a little bit. So imagine this, you, you're a mom and pop shop and you make mugs like these. Okay. But you only make like your capacity and the workers that you can hire that can, you know, fill you, like your budget can only support having three workers. So you make around, let's say 10 of these mugs a day. And then a big company, let's say Microsoft, for instance, right, came in and the, and you want to get a deal with Microsoft where we, you can supply them with 200,000 mugs, yeah. okay, 200,000 employees, 200,000 mugs. What would you do? You need to go hire people, more people, 
you need to go buy materials and you need to go you know get uh, uh take care of the logistics like big ship sh- big uh, you know trucks to kind of carry these mugs and deliver them to microsoft for example okay so what would you do you don't have enough money in your pocket to support that kind of deal but you can fulfill that kind of deal if some big company decided to fund you to support you so what paul's company do is that they go and say okay if you go to the bank today they will slash you they will destroy you in interest rates they will destroy you they wouldn't even some some of banks they wouldn't even say what you're a mom and pop shop of three workers we're not even going to give you a dollar or i guess an english pound in paul's situation right so <laughs> what would paul do he would go and say okay what if i got a funder bank or whatever and a buyer and the buyer tells the funder no this deal is legit and i need this product right paul so the buyer yeah. and the funder you're making them talk to each other so the funder would say okay as long as it's microsoft or amazon or one of these big companies then maybe this is a real deal right and, and this this happens ahead. with products where like there's patents or copyrights or things like that that are protecting them so mm-hmm. that um you're the only company or there's a very small group of companies that are specializing in this or it can often happen in industries where um there's very high demand but there's only limited numbers of suppliers yeah so then these big companies are feeling like they don't have much choice so they have to go to these smaller you have to work with that supplier that's right Yeah, yeah they have to work with what suppliers are essentially available and and the problem is it's it's not that necessarily the big companies are making bad choices Mm -hmm. in, in in you know in potentially taking on from their point of view risky business because they don't yep. know if that smaller company can deliver yeah the the issue is more you as a small mom and pop shop as you like to put it yeah have built a product that's really niche it's really valuable and it and it's it's got something and oh, now all of a man. sudden uh-huh. yeah, yeah and now all of a sudden there's this massive demand for it that's just come out of nowhere and so you're sitting there going geez how how do i deliver this yeah and the only way that you can potentially deliver this is an influx of cash. And yep. so, and, and the way that the financial systems are set up, and this is why Hassan hates fintech, right? Is yeah. <laughs> fintech only works for people that understand fintech yep. and accountants and like, you know, um, shareholders and, and people basically money only works for money. Yep. yep. And <clears throat> what we're trying to do is we're trying to take that big, money problem and we're trying to say look money isn't the problem anymore just do your business yeah and and this is the sort of product that has historically only been available to those big companies and it's on the the fortune 500s for example to go to the banks and tell the banks this is what we want and of course go ahead and fund that business because we need that product and we are yeah. fortune 500 you're going to listen to us. <laughs> yeah. And, and because th- those companies are sufficiently big enough, the banks actually take them seriously. And and this is the thing. like The bank doesn't have that... an option then, Paul, because these big companies could be like, well, you're not going to help me get my business done. I'm not going to work with you anymore. I'm going to go to U.S. Bank or Wells Fargo or Chase. You know, you pissed <laughs> me off. You know, so they have to. They they don't yeah. have the option, right? Go ahead, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and from the the Fortune 500 company's point of view, um, they have to they have to deal with a finance entity, but they don't care what the finance entity is to some extent. And the problem gets even worse as well because there are international laws that um, across multiple um, states, across mm-hmm. you know all uh, multiple regions of the world that say things like um, an individual finance entity um, can't do regular business with another entity that is considered to be kind of like day to day without showing like a commercial interest. Mm. Um, So there's there's like a sort of like SEC border here from from Mm -hmm. the point of view of the Americans, where Mm -hmm. basically what they're talking about here is if you've got enough of um, an investment in another company, you're mm-hmm. considered to be part of that company. Mm-hmm. So banks have a hard line that's drawn, which I think is around about 200 million. 
Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about like Fortune 500 companies at any given point in time, um, you know, we de dealt with a major airliner in Europe. Yeah. Um, at any given point in time, they might have like 10 billion in cash just sat in their bank account. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, well, there's no value in it just being sat there. Right. It's not making us any money. But if we're factoring our invoices, we can take some of that cash, pay them early. So we've got less money in the bank, but we're making more profit because we're paying them early. We're paying them less. Yeah. So the Fortune 500s are also making money. Yeah. But the little guy is like, great, I'm getting these massive orders that I otherwise yeah. wouldn't be able to get. So I'm making money. The finance entity sitting in the middle in, in many cases and going, great, I'm taking we're, my We're moving their funds off. around. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so it's I win, mean, win, win. <laughs> it's, 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 dude, this is this is freaking genius i swear to god like i don't know like again like you know i'm not super you know invested in fintech but this here is telling me something right this here is telling me you know okay this guy you know this guy you know will support you know this guy will do the actual work and this guy will benefit from it you know it's it's very 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 interesting how this is working. I love it. I love it, Paul. So, so, okay. So let me ask you this then. <clears throat> Your system receives and manages transactions from where to where, because I see requests coming from here. Mm -hmm. I see funds going here and I see orders going here. And then there's pay, pay costs for manufacturing and resources. Where does your system live? Like if this if this guy here is your system, where does it live? Let's say let's call it all system. All system. Go ahead. Mm. So effectively what we've done is I guess the, the, the closest way to explain it is to think of it like insurance. Okay. You can go directly to an insurance company if you want to get insured for something, or you can go to a broker. Mm -hmm. And a broker is acting as a middleman between you as the little guy and some big insurance company. I, I never heard the word broker before. Yeah, weird. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just missing with you. Did yeah. you see the pause then? I was like, what? <laughs> Let me tell you something. We will talk about things that are very serious. But we got to cheer up a little bit, mate. This is going to be a long session. So let's just have fun. But yeah, yeah, go ahead. Because I say brokers more than anything ever. But yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm listening. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting because now I'm starting to talk your language. So <laughs> right. yeah, it, it, it's, we can start to see how all the pieces are going to fit together, right? Yes. So you so, are you're basically your place, your business is the place you're the safe haven for the suppliers to go and say i need help i need you to find me funders i have buyers but i need to find funders and i need to make that connection and you guys are going to help me make it happen is that how it is yeah so so the ideal model is what we refer to as e-invoicing so okay. e-invoicing is where a supplier would upload to our platform on the cloud their mm -hmm. invoices and we would take those invoices, import them into the system, and then we would send those invoices to the buyer. And then um, we would also send them to the funder. So we're acting as the middleman distributing the information. Uh... Yeah. At the moment, um, because we and ourselves are a very small company, we're trying to establish the, the pieces. What we're doing is we're talking to the finance entities and we're talking to the, the big buyers. Mm. And what we're doing is we're setting up the contracts with them pulling them into our system and then they're onboarding all of their clients with us okay so hold tight hold tight hold tight so in in the ideal world your supplier will give you invoices yeah. right for the for the costs all the arrows point towards my system basically yeah so you, they're giving you invoices so these guys are giving you invoices send invoices right and your and you think of them more generically as transactions because the word invoice has a very specific meaning and there are different types of transactions of which invoice is one let, let, let's say cost transactions would that be okay 
uh, just transactions because they're yeah, yeah we'll, we'll come back to why later I, i'm sure <laughs> okay so <laughs> these guys minutes. are providing you with the transactions yeah and you are sharing these transactions with the funder yeah. and the and the buyer right that's it that's all that it is so at the moment what we're doing is we're getting those transactions from the buyer from the buyer okay yeah so what we do is we get in we as the the provider of the platform get into yep. a contract with the buyer to provide them with a custom so what we're doing is we're white boxing so yep. we give them a version of our portal but with their branding on it yep yep and so they're interacting with their suppliers they're placing what we call a purchase order so the purchase order is i want x from you the supplier mm -hmm. sends the buyer back mm -hmm. a okay here's an invoice for x Okay, so eventually what we want to do is we want to get to the point where the buyer would send the purchase order through our platform. We would send that to the supplier. The yep. supplier would send back the invoice to our platform and we mm -hmm. would send that to the buyer. So it would boing, boing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, <laughs> you're, 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 the, you're, you're the middle man between. So, okay, so let me just add this, this next one. This here, uh, send back invoices. Okay, so you, today, the state of things is that you don't even know these guys, technically. Like, yeah. this guy goes and says, I'm going to place my order, and this supplier will send back invoices, and the buyer will give you these transactions, right? Yeah, and then out of nowhere, the buyer, we, we get them as a client, and mm -hmm. then the buyer says, okay, we've got all of these, um, we've got what we call master data. So mm -hmm. the master data is information about the companies that they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And when I say about the companies that they're dealing with, we mm -hmm. ask for information about all companies involved in the process. So we ask for names, addresses, and what we call Everything. references. So oh, like yeah. um, tax references, but also their internal references for mm -hmm. companies, for all companies that are involved in this process. Okay, so they're what we represent in the system as being the buyer, the supplier, the funder. Okay, so we have a list of companies and we do what's called onboarding, where we pull those companies into the system. And then once the system has the, the company information set up, um, we then start tipping in the transactions and linking them up to these companies. Now, as you can imagine, this gets complicated because in the real world, um any company can trade with any other company yeah so you, so you could have got, duplications yeah so you can have a situation where um a company is on the buyer side of some set of invoices and, and the supplier they're on the supplier side, of, side of, another... of another set of invoices yeah. and potentially being on the funder side of another set of invoices oh my god yeah so if, if but, they're but wait wait a second i want to close the loop on this one and and yeah. just forgive me here because this is important the state of things or the system that you're trying to decide i know now your your dream state i got it and it's not and it wouldn't be that hard because i have that in the back of my head but this guy goes and says i want mugs from you what do you what do you call it in england do you call them mugs too yeah mugs is fine <laughs> and then this you guy act, you act like there's this whole different language in america i mean besides you like having to like explain everything i mean we call it pavement right that wasn't descriptive enough for you you couldn't figure out where to walk so you had to say sidewalk <laughs> like, that's right we all know it's next to the road we all know it's on the side right i mean that's but it, right. get, it gets really worse it really bad right because like we call it horse riding that wasn't enough like you know you had to specify that you had to be on the back of the horse so horseback <laughs> riding right what happened before then <laughs> this is this is the content that i live for <laughs> pavement <laughs> what is that anyway <laughs> so, so <laughs> we put rubbish in the bin oh no you're not happy with that you had to specify it was a waste paper basket specifically that you're putting paper that is wasted in a basket <laughs> oh my god paul that's hilarious so, so welcome listen, to america listen, listen. <laughs> 
<laughs> you don't function unless you describe everything with a what sentence. Do you, what do you what do you call cookies? Biscuits? Is that what <laughs> we still have cookies? We have cookies and biscuits. They're different things. <laughs> Okay, hear me out. Hear me out. So, <laughs> so, so the buyer sends a, a purchase order, and then they get back invoices, and they share these transactions with you. Where does the funder play into that flow? Right. You find so, the funder for them, don't you? Yeah. So the previous diagram that you had around the the contracting, mm -hmm. um, effectively in the background, all of this is set up. Okay. Okay. So everybody like already agreement. had the sign up already done between all three of them without yeah. your, without you being in the picture. No, 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 this is part of the process. We help facilitate that as well. Yep, I'm still with you. Keep going. I'm listening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we go to the other diagram again, let's go to the other diagram. <laughs> Sorry, we're jumping around a lot. <laughs> that that's okay. Just just take it slow and explain it because it's gonna help not just you and me i want people to see how we design system like paul you and i are senior level engineers so i want people to see how how do people actually design systems in the real world right and how do we discuss these issues and how do we adapt patterns this is the real stuff this is not hello world kitty youtube video learn c sharp in 10 minutes that's not what this is and if you are expecting that from my content you're in the wrong place i'll tell you that much if you don't believe me go watch the cul-de-sac videos you'll understand this is not your cs 101 kind of content that you want to watch but anyway i saw a guy on reddit the other day says i will advise you to watch hassan's content but i have to warn you this is not some kitty <laughs> programming that you're used to it's like come on man that's not how you sell the product anyway so 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 hear me out the contract is already done so that basically means that even this guy is out of the picture because this guy already talked to this guy behind the scene in this contract yeah. and they already did requesting the fund hold on i think i figured out what you're doing requesting the fund and also it's not just that it's that that this guy already funded as well like this and you are in the you are sitting here only dealing with the buyer at all times did i did i say that right or did i miss anything no so okay, once perfect. once those okay. contracts are set up, which is why I highlighted the contracts, okay, yeah. the agreement in principle is how you've drawn it, mm -hmm. contractually mm -hmm. speaking. Okay? Yes. Um, so everybody's agreed, and it, it all points back to so because again, because legal yep. reasons it has to be a paper. Will yeah, well, what will typically happen is there's a bit of paper between every two of those parties okay mm -hmm. so there's actually three different contracts oh my god oh yeah. so it's actually more like a contract that's sitting hold on paul because i like pictures you know yeah. okay again america what do you think pictures easy things yeah. so there, there is a... <laughs> <laughs> you freaking troll okay <laughs> Just hear me out. No, I, I no, I we need to change buyer so that it reads person that buys stuff. <laughs> Would That's that be crazy. more descriptive for you? <laughs> really I don't want you to struggle here as an American. Let, let me ask you this Do you say slacks in Britain? Slacks, is, uh, suspenders, like pants, suspenders. What is yeah. this? The 1900? What's the matter with you? <laughs> Are they like the, the straps that go between like waist over the shoulder to waist? No, right? no, no, slack, like no, slacks is why you just go wear to work like pants. Oh, yeah, pants. Oh, yeah, you guys, yeah. So we refer to pants as being underwear. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> what do you say, pantaloons? <laughs> Trousers. Trousers. Oh, my lord. Yeah. <laughs> oh my lord this is hilarious this is better than the actual system we should just create a table <laughs> <laughs> of, all, of all the language misconceptions here's how america has broken the english language <laughs> <laughs> that's right okay so it's actually three contracts you know you know yeah. what's you know what's fascinating me the most about all of this how thorough 
See, I, I want to say something to people watching us. If you're a software engineer working on any domain, you better understand it the way Paul explains it. Because if you don't understand the domain, you just turn into a code monkey. You're just writing whatever everybody else is telling you to write without understanding the big picture. And I promise you, if you just do what someone else is telling you, you're going to hit a brick wall so fast because you don't see the big picture. You're, you're programming in the dark, right? Yeah, so you I really don't know. Uh -huh. Go ahead. I yeah. often tell people that, um, so HR is one of those functions that has mm -hmm. to know a little bit about everything because mm -hmm. they're always sticking their noses in, you know, often every when business. there's a problem, you know, yep. or every part of a business, right? Yep. And so HR is one of those functions where they just need to have an understanding, but they only have to have an understanding of the people. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. IT is genuinely to my knowledge, the only industry that when you get into it, you have to understand everything about every other industry and everything that everybody else does. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this... Um, Everyone and their mother. You have to understand everything. <laughs> yeah. So if you're going to be very good at building a product for the industry that you're working in, you have mm -hmm. to understand that industry. And not only have to understand that industry, you have to understand how to explain to a computer how that industry needs to work. Mm -hmm. And so the problem that I found, particularly with this, like you said, you know, I'm only pushing data around, but that's literally what every program does. It's just pushing data around, right? Mm -hmm. But here it helps to visualize the real world aspect and, uh, or should I say, impact of what data you're pushing around. You know, I've had situations where if I lose an invoice, mm -hmm. I can lose a hundred million euros. Oh, my God. A single God. invoice. Oh, a, my Lord. A single invoice. Yeah. So when you when my system has a rounding error, it it's really frowned upon. Right. It, it cannot happen. Because it can because it can be millions and millions of euros. Yeah. That's well, right. When you're talking about, say, tens of thousands of transactions every time we receive a new feed of data, which is daily, by the way, uh -huh. if oh you've got God. a rounding error of a penny on every one of those transactions, that's 10,000 pennies. That's like that's like this <laughs> this movie Office Space where they put the uh, they put the fraction in, on every transaction. Remember that hacker who put a fraction? Yeah. I'm not giving you ideas or anything. <laughs> <laughs> You put a fraction on the penny, you yeah. know, like a small rounding error that even like your integer value or your double value will, will round it automatically, right? I've often wondered if that's how we could compute our pay as a provider. <laughs> Possibly. Paul, that's possible. Let me, let me tell you a story that happened a while back, a couple of engineers from Jordan, right? Mm. The, you know, a, a, a country in, uh, in the Middle East, they wanted to uh, rewrite the entire court system and digitize it. So all the software companies, bidders, some of them said 250,000, some of them said 2 million, some of them said 500,000. They're overbidding each other. And then these two boys from Jordan, they said zero dollars. So... The people looking to build the banking so said, what do you mean? He said, all what we want is one dirham per transaction. We don't <laughs> want you to pay anything. But every time you file a case in the court, I want you to give me one dirham. After the first year, they realized these two boys made more money than the sum, the sum of all the other bidders. Yeah. They had to make they had to they had to renegotiate the deal with them because they're very <laughs> smart. You know, they're not even like you think like they're a bunch of like tired old mules, some, you know, 40, 50 year old. Nope. They were like a bunch of 20 year olds. Mm. And how did they just come up with the idea to be like, I'm going to build you the system for free. And this system is the same system that's running, you know, a lot of the court system on that side of the world today. It's it's really good. So yeah, you know, back to your story about transactions. Oh my God, Paul, this is economy this of is scale, subscription right? Subscription model. This is a circuit. This is a subscription model, right? That's how yeah. Netflix and all these companies started. Do you remember a time where you get to just pay for the software and that's it, and it ends there? Now yeah. everyone is moving over. 
to the subscription model. And, and this is how our business functions today. It is a subscription model. Um, there's some pricing changes that we potentially need to make to it. But um, yeah, it, it's exactly that. Um, I, when I say it's, it's exactly that, it's exactly that in that it's a subscription model. We're not pricing things in the way that we've described yet. But yeah, so I think we should come back to the problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's go back to this. So you're saying... Between the buyer and the funder, there is a contract. Between the funder and the supplier, there is a contract. And between the supplier and the buyer, there is a contract. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. So they will be agreed um, and will facilitate and will orchestrate um, that interaction to get those things set up. <coughs> Once okay. those things are set up, we will represent those interactions or those connections, shall we say, Mm -hmm. in our system in the system so yeah. um typically as i was saying the way that it works at the moment is the buyer is going to be the the guy that's going to start sending us data so he's going to send us potentially from not from his accounting system but from his erp system mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. journal entries mm -hmm. that are about line items mm -hmm. from invoices or from yeah. transactions so this is where things get interesting okay so we receive um, this information and what we do with it is if we know that there's a contract set up because we help facilitate that between that buyer and a funder mm -hmm. through our system, we then share that information with the funder. So you go and system, share that data with the funder. Yeah. And the same to the supplier. Now, Okay, so you're There's, sharing you're sharing the contract information or the transactions? The transactions. Okay. Yeah, so the, the contract information is considered to be sort of pre-agreed, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we can store the, the contract information in the system. Um, but again, due to trust and things like that, um, yeah. Yeah. people, particularly like CFOs of, of the bigger companies, prefer to keep that information offline. Yeah. Um, wet signatures got it yeah okay, anything that's got an actual signature of a person you know a human being is probably stored in a vault somewhere particularly okay, so when you're talking about this level of money if you know what i mean so paul paul your your buyer is the orchestrator not you yes then. Okay. um well so what what's happening prior to all of this coming into play is we've gone to uh, an event or, you know, we've put out some marketing or whatever, and we've effectively approached the buyer and we've sold them this solution. Mm. So we, we say, look, this is what we want to do. This is how we want to help your business. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of pros and, and good reasons why the buyer would want to come on board. Yeah. There's lots of reasons why the funder would want to come on board. And there's lots of reasons why the supplier would want to come on board. And they're all different reasons. Um, so what we're trying to do initially is try and establish what we call verticals, mm -hmm. which is basically um, within a given industry. So if you took something like um, car manufacturing, mm -hmm. right, what we want to do is we want to grab all the big car manufacturers and all of the people that they get their parts from. Mm -hmm. um, and we want to get them talking through our system. Right. Then what we can do is we can say, okay, within that vertical, there's a mm -hmm. set of commonly agreed best practices that we can then facilitate. You're standardizing. You're standardizing and normalizing. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So that helps us then normalize a whole industry. Mm. Yeah. And because we're using the power of the cloud for this, uh, we then have the benefit that we can run analytics on that trading behavior. And we can right. actually go to these big guys and we can say, hey, you're spending a lot of money here on a regular basis. If you do the business this way, you could save some money. And the same to the suppliers. You know, so there's lots of ways that we can actually impact in positive ways above and beyond this process, yep. the way that they do business. So um, but this current, is much further down the line. <laughs> there's the current state of things, but you want to build the system to only need to also be able to sustain future ambitions, you know, yeah. that can normalize the industry. And, you know, l let me ask you something. Let's say I am a buyer. Yeah. Okay. And I already orchestrate, orchestrated the contracts and I worked with the funder and the supplier. Why do I need you? Okay. So 
if we're talking about, for example, I referred to a major airline earlier, okay? Mm -hmm. 10 billion in the bank. You go to a funder and the funder says, great, legally, I'll take 200 million of that and I'll mm -hmm. fund it. Mm -hmm. And the buyer goes, well, that's not helpful to me. I need to get rid of at least 2 billion out of my bank account. Otherwise, that's basically going to end up costing me because of yep. the tax laws work. Yep. Right? So at this point, the buyer approaching funders, they're going to have to do this multiple times. So from their point of view, it's just overhead. Yeah. Whereas if they connect to us, we'll facilitate that multiple times on their behalf. Mm. They don't have to handle that headache. Yeah. You don't have to yeah. deal with that. So what happens is, um, and you've got to bear in mind that a Fortune 500 company, what the world sees, mm -hmm. for example, is Microsoft. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Microsoft is not just Microsoft. Microsoft is... Of... Yeah, the, and, mm -hmm. there's the parent company that yeah. owns all of yeah. Microsoft. Then yeah. there's all these these divisions of LinkedIn, Microsoft. GitHub, and you know you have all the mm -hmm. yeah, and they all have systems. Yeah, and all those systems are all interacting with suppliers. Yep, and they're all individual systems, and yeah. they all do things differently. Yep. However, most of them are going to be like I don't know. Let's say. Um, 50% of Microsoft runs on Dynamics. Mm -hmm. So once one part of Microsoft has built a Dynamics integration module between that company and us, 50% mm -hmm. of Microsoft can now be onboarded into our system. That's true. Once you have the plugin, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. So rinse, repeat. Okay, so we've got the ability to integrate with SAP systems, for example. Well, pretty much um, as far as I'm aware, Pretty much every Fortune 500 company at some point has sat in the middle somewhere. <laughs> um, probably Microsoft is probably one of those exceptions. Because um, okay. uh, I suspect that they've probably got their own stuff. But yep. yeah, so it, it's one of these things where it's like, actually, once you figure out how to integrate with those platforms, you can then go into these big companies and say, look, we know you've got this platform. We know that it's a pain in the ass to deal with. We know you've got regular phone calls coming from your suppliers asking you where the state of something is. Yep. We also know that you've got this whole tree of companies underneath you. And depending on which piece of it it is that that supplier is dealing with, it's a different question and you have to forward them through to a different person. There's this whole trail of figuring out who they want to speak to. They may already have the right contact, but in the event that they've got the right contact, the answer to that question may not be a standard one. Um, one big selling point for big CFOs, um, uh, for Fortune 500 CFOs, is we'll say to them as part of our sales pitch, hey, we're going to come into your business. We're going to spot all the different pieces of your business process, particularly from the financial side, that are either non-standard, broken, mm -hmm. break laws in some mm -hmm. cases, um, or just simply don't work. And we're going to poke ho holes in them, massive gaping holes, and we're going to cause you problems. We mm -hmm. are going to do this, right? Mm -hmm. And they go, yeah, no worries. We'll, we'll fix that. None of them ever do. None of them ever do. What happens is the problem arises. We explain the problem. And they go, well, yeah, but that, that's that part of the business. and It's fine. Can you just work around it? And we go, fine, we'll work around it. So this is why I've built some technologies around the system as well to help, um, such as my workflow engine, things like yep. that, to help yep. with those weird scenarios. But yeah. I don't want to focus on that that piece of it. Let's keep that to one side. This It's the transactional stuff. That, but long story short, um, what's essentially happening here is we're taking these transactions in and we're enabling everyone that deals with um, a very large, potentially tree of companies that are under this umbrella of Microsoft or mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, to interact in a standardized way. And, and this is what you want. You want to exude a corporate brand. Yeah. When you get to that level, you don't want. Um, so one example, I remember dealing with another um, tech company, shall we say, of a fruity kind. <laughs> um, uh -huh. And um, the I got threatened with my job once because the, uh -huh. yeah because we um, it, this was for another company that I was working for at the time 
Um, yep. We had a contract with them that we were going to do some marketing. And the complaint that came back was the curved corners that I had on the branding on the web page that was, it was basically a thing that would do um, like surveys. Um, it would send like links over email and the user would click a link and they would fill in like three simple questions and then they'd be served up like a white paper. Uh -huh. And it was a way of uh, potentially uh, generating leads essentially to, to create new business. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I got threatened with my job because the curve on those corners was out by one pixel. Oh my God. On that fruity company's branding specification. And because it was out by one pixel, um, it potentially opened up them to get sued by a certain Japanese manufacturer who we will not name. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they'd recently come out of a massive argument about curvy corners on some mobile platform that I know nothing about. <laughs> so, yeah. It, it, I, it, I, I see what you're saying. The, the, the problems that big companies have are just mind-blowing i mean i had another cfo that said to me once um i don't care how much it costs i care how much i'm open to exposure i care about for example um what a government can do to me mm -hmm. if your system isn't accurate enough or yeah yeah you know so i mean we have one guy who would refuse to go to america because he was under the impression that somebody on 40k a year could be bribed into sticking him in Guantanamo Bay just for going there. You know, <laughs> absolutely convinced. And I was like, yeah, but but the thing is, when you're talking about billions and they're a potential competitor for the equivalent business that's of national interest to America, uh -huh. you, you can see that, you know, it's a real concern for them. However, it's not a problem that like you or I ever is yep. ever going to come up against, right? Yep, yep, yep. Because like we, we don't have this this problem of like yep. this problem of having billions in the bank. This is one percenter problem. Yeah, this, this, this totally. Yeah. So when I'm trying to like solve problems for for this kind of process, I'm looking at this and going, these one percenters are bonkers, but. Yep. At the same time, I'm like, well, actually, yeah, if you look at it from their point of view, that they're not fussed about financial issues. They're fussed about, like, prison. Yeah, <laughs> legal know, issues. That's yeah, they're, they're fussed about legal problems. Who's going to yeah. sue them when? You know, what, what's the next big issue going to be? That's what yeah. they care about. Some, some, some lawyers just make a living on the fact that you're, like, some people just make a living out of, you know, observing what's going on with some big companies like you see those all the time paul do you have you ever gotten an email saying hey if you're a samsung user you are entitled to thirty-five thousand dollars because of the settlement that we did that's their job that's what they do right yeah. they just sit there and they'd be like how can i you know destroy you know a big company how can i chunk off 50 million dollars out of them every quarter it's not yeah. going to do much for them, but it's going to do much for me. How you know what I, I mean? convince 10,000 people to join my class action yep. that I'm going to yep. make up right now? Yep. Just, just to put it to the big yep. guy. And then yeah. the big guy will be like, I don't want that kind of noise. You know, yeah. I really don't care about some 50 million shekels that I could, that I basically spend on my coffee and tea you know, in the pantry or whatever, you know, so I'm just going to go ahead and give it to them and settle right so so anyway this is why a lot of these big companies have like an army of lawyers you have to you can't survive this way but let's go back to this okay okay my friend so i get it now you basically say that the state of things today and how you want to design the system today while keeping the future state of mind i have a question for you though if this buyer has details from the funder and details from the supplier. How would the buyer provide you with this with this edge here? Do you see that red edge? How does it know about that part? If this supplier is just giving you invoices, does the funder tell the buyer how much they funded the supplier? Is that how? No, 
so that happens on our system and that's this is a key mm. part of what our system does mm. so as well as collating the data from mm -hmm. potentially that whole chain of of buyer companies mm -hmm. we're taking all of that data about all of the transactions that they have throughout that chain with mm -hmm. all of the suppliers in that chain so this is where supply chain finance um, is the common expression used right yeah so what we're doing is we're pulling all of that information together. We've got one then um, continuous constant picture of everything that that buyer entity is doing with everyone that they're trading with. Okay? Mm -hmm. Then what we do is we slice that data up. And for each supplier, we say, here you go. This is your cut of that data that you can see. And <clears throat> what then happens is we look at the, the contracting information that we've been provided with. And we say, OK, where we know that um, that buyer and that supplier are trading with that funder, what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, for that cut of data that is represented in our system by mm -hmm. that relationship between the three of them, we're mm -hmm. going to share that information with the funder. Mm -hmm. And what the funder does is the funder generates something that we call the offer. Yeah. And so the offer is... Um, it's a batch object that what we do for um, is we say, okay, each line item is going to be a link to a transaction. Right. And they're going to say, okay, I'm going to buy these transactions for this amount. Ah. And it's called the offer because what they do is they, um, we send them the transaction information. They send us back the offer. Mm -hmm. And then the supplier can go into our portal provided with the buyer's branding on it. Mm -hmm. So they think they're dealing with the buyer. They're dealing with us, but they're dealing yeah. with the buyer through us, if that makes sense. Yeah. And um, do you allow multiple funders to bid on these line items? We can do, yeah. Um, it requires... Um, so here's the thing, right? I've built a system that allows for effectively an infinite number of possibilities um but we allow the companies by contract to choose what kind of possibilities they want to allow within their mm -hmm. business process mm -hmm. so this is where we need to start talking about buckets so not bucket... yet hold tight hold tight okay <laughs> um so all right so reeling it back in a little bit so yeah What's going to happen then is once that offer is generated, depending on the business model, um, so there's a difference between what we call a systematic offer mm -hmm. and an a la carte offer. Mm -hmm. A systematic offer is as soon as the funder has generated it, according to the agreed business rules, um, we take that offer and we consider it systematically accepted. So what happens then is the supplier is automatically paid by the funder for that offer. In an a la carte situation, the offer is sent back to our system. The supplier will then log in and accept the offer. Mm. And only when they accept the offer does the funder then pay them for it. <coughs> Make sense? Yeah, so you're basically saying, hold on. In the system, I'll, I'll take these three again. Mm -hmm. What's up with the three components and everything? Welcome to my insanity, my crazy. Right. Work. When you were talking about the rule of threes the other yep. day, I was just like, "Yep, yep, <laughs> yep." So, 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 Paul, you know these guys, they make an offer through your system still, right? So through your system, you know this buyer says. Here is my, um, here is here is the transaction. Here is what I want. Here is the products that I want. Here is the services, and these guy and you send to these guys a, you share the information so they give you back an offer, and then the supplier learns about this offer and agrees to it, and that's only when your system will go and say, okay, notify the supplier and start the process. Did I get that right? So. So it starts from the buyer. The buyer says, I want this product, right? And here is yeah. my supplier. So the, uh, go, go ahead. Go ahead. So, so, yeah, the buyer places an order with the supplier. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it might be easier before you start diagramming it out to just write mm-hmm. the list. <laughs> okay, let's do that. So, so buyer, buyer, so, pl- buyer, place order with supplier. Yeah, the okay. supplier sends back an invoice. Supplier provides an invoice. The supplier provides an invoice to the buyer. Buyer. Okay, got it. Mm-hmm. The the buyer mm-hmm. effectively shares um, that received invoice with with Paul. Let, let's keep it. Let's keep it simple. Let's say let's keep us out of the mix and talk about how the process would work if we weren't involved. Yeah. Okay. So the buyer shares the invoice with, or the sorry, the transaction with the funder. Yeah. The funder generates an offer. Yep. Yep. I I think I get it. Yep. And then the fund. Okay. The funder generates, and then the supplier agrees to the offer, right? And that's when yeah. The 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 funder gives the offer to the supplier. Okay. That's it. The supplier will then. So best case, supplier accepts the offer and gives that back to the funder. Gives what back? The, that's acceptance? The accepted offer, yeah. So think of it like um, the funder says, here's a piece of paper, sign it. And if you sign it, we'll give you a wedge of cash. Yep, yep. Kind yep, of yep. like that, but digitally, yeah. And so then, then the, the, su- the supplier goes, yep, yeah, signed. Here you go. Here's your piece of paper. And now yep. the process kicks off. The work starts. Um, so then the next thing that happens is out of our system, the funder mm. then goes and deals with their payment portal and pays the supplier's bank account that amount of money. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. at that point, the invoice is paid to the sum of the offer value. Yep. And so from the supplier's point of view, they've been paid. That invoice is clear. Now they're ready to work because now they have money to work. Yeah. Yeah. And then, say, 60 days later, the buyer then actually pays the invoice to the supplier. So the supplier pays? Uh, Sorry, to the funder. (laughs) So the buyer will pay? The funder, and that's it. The transaction is over. Yeah. Right? So yeah. what's what's going on here is there's one invoice and there's one offer. These two things are both transactions. They have a cost mm-hmm. and they'll have tax and things like that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and effectively, the funder is paying all the invoices, but mm-hmm. the buyer is paying all the offers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, in a scenario where the supplier doesn't accept the offer, the buyer will just pay the invoice on usual payment terms. Which is very expensive for them. They can't support that. Potentially, yeah. You said you said who, who pays it according to uh, to the payment terms, the supplier or the funder? Uh, supplier, which, right? Which document are we talking about? So the last step. The last step, if so, if if the supplier said, I don't accept the offer from the funder, they have to uh, abide by the payment terms from the buyer, right? Yeah, so that's a standard transaction as if which, the funder which, wasn't involved. So that, at that point, the them. buyer that pays would, the supplier. Yeah, that would just kill them in the market. They won't be able to sustain. It would be unsustainable. because well, now that, they have... that, That's how regular business works at the moment, right? So right. it's not that it's unsustainable. It's just more expensive. But potentially, yeah, the supplier, if if they can't come to a reasonable agreement with the funder. Mm-hmm. There are some real edge cases where the supplier just couldn't take the order from the buyer. So they'd have to there, check the order. Yep. There's also a situation if your buyer goes bankrupt, these guys are screwed because they can't they don't they're not legally obligated to pay them anything. They'll be like, We're bankrupt. We declared bankruptcy. We can't pay Chances you. Chances of that? <laughs> it's a situation, right? That it's a situation. It's an edge case, but it's a situation. I see what you're doing now. I see it, right? And you're sitting in the middle of all of this, orchestrating and communicating and managing the transactions between the. This is brilliant. Our system is brilliant. just one big orchestration. That's all it is. <laughs> now, there are different ways that this can happen, right? So, mm-hmm. for example, um, you remember how I said buyer companies mm-hmm. can be a tree of child companies. Yep. Yep. So sometimes they'll have a subsidiary company, which is their finance entity. 
Yeah. And that finance entity will fund all of their transactions. So the funder could be an internal thing. Yep. And that's what we call an early discounting model. So they're not um, actually doing factoring as such. They're doing early discounting, which is basically a, a funder saying, hey, if you agree to give us a little bit of a discount, we'll just pay you sooner. So, so the buyer and the funder are the same? Sort of, in, yeah. In there, there'll be different. There'll probably be different legal entities between like the the, the purchasing company and the funding company. Yeah. But from the outside world, from a corporate kind of branding point of view, it's I'm dealing with Microsoft in both cases. But there's like Microsoft and then there's like Microsoft Financing UK or something. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, <laughs> OK, so let's let's do this. Let's do this together. Here's what we can do. This whole flow. This whole flow starts by the supplier. You know, in, in your system. You are the diamond in these transactions. So if I use diamond like this, that's you. That's okay. your system. The supplier is giving you a bunch of transactions, right? And you call them transactions because they're multiple layers upon layers upon layers of financial well, the, details. So, yeah, I, I use the general term transactions because, mm -hmm. like, if I say the word invoice, okay, mm -hmm. um, People will say to me, well, what kind of invoice are you talking about? Are you talking about a sales invoice? Are you talking about a, um, a debit note? Are you talking about it? So there are types of invoice. Mm -hmm. um, then there are things like credit notes. Um, so let's say you're in the industry of farming. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you're the big Fortune 500 company. Mm -hmm. I'm the small supplier. And you say to me, right, I want a thousand tons of milk from the cows in your field. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I go, brilliant. Yeah, no worries. I get the funder involved. I, I finance the operation because I'm probably going to have to buy a few more cows. Um, mm -hmm. And I say, yeah, you can have your milk, you know, when we agree. Let me um, stop you right there, Paul. It's heifer. Heifer. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. No, I'm fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, so then let's say, okay, we've got this, um, we've got a rolling order set up, right? Because effectively I'm constantly going to be providing as the, uh, you know, I'm a big, um, say I'm, I don't like, um, uh, think of an American brand. I'm Best Buy, right? Yep. And I'm putting milk on my shelves. Yep. Okay. And I'm ordering from you, local farmer, yeah. um, as much uh, milk as I can get so I can put it on the shelf. You, you have invoices from the local farmer. You're just sharing these invoices with yeah. your system, right? Yeah. Okay. So we've got this rolling process going as previously mm. described. Okay. Um, a batch of milk comes in, but for some reason, there's something wrong with it. I don't know. Let's say um, one of the cows in your herd was ill, come down yeah. with something, and it tainted the milk. Okay. So I have a batch of, say, out of a thousand tons of milk, um, 100 tons 100. of milk are spoiled. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what happens is I, as the buyer, will issue you with a credit note. And I'm saying, hey, I'm not going to pay this much of the invoice because we agree that mm -hmm. that that's not selling. You're going to give me that quality and you didn't get, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So now I've got an invoice with an attached credit note. Mm -hmm. So now I've got an invoice for, you know, some number of dollars, less some portion of that, which has been credited off. That can still be funded. Yeah. So yeah. this is a common situation that does happen. We, we what, get why? Out. What? What? What would you bit like? Why? What would? Why would the funder fund a bad deal? Like, then like the, hmm. the, the funder is not funding a bad deal. They're funder. They're funding the amount of transactions that are effectively fundable and outstanding. Mm. So that there are some things like um, in the EU, there's this thing called eco tax, mm -hmm. which is. Um, for tax reasons, for legal reasons, you cannot fund that. It's it's just a tax, okay? So we might see, say, um, a two-line invoice that has some product and then some amount of eco-tax. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We can only fund that first line. Yeah. So what we have to do is we have to tell the funder this information. We have to say, mm -hmm. hey, on this invoice, this is the fundable amount. Yeah. Um, yeah. The rest of this is not fundable. And yeah. if and again, if there's a credit note attached to that, yep. that second line 
plus the, the sum of that credit note affect how much of that invoice is still outstanding. And then they do things that is even more complicated. So what will wait, happen wait, is the wait buyer... on that one. Wait, 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 wait on that one. I know you have a lot of things you want to share, but just wait on me on that one. Okay. Stay here. This is what I call an epic, like a scenario. And we're going to break it into feature. I, pr I promise you. This yeah, is yeah. They're just putting on a PM hat there for a second since Nick is not around. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so hold on. So, so, so the supplier in this one transaction, you know, you basically go and say, me as a system, this is how you want your system to be designed. Stop me at any point in time, but don't worry about the details <laughs> yet. Paul, just stay with me for a second, okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, you're basically going and sharing transactions with your funder and doing the same thing with your um, with your with your supplier. Is that the right next step in that system? Uh. Yeah, so did you mean to say in the top one, the buyer sends us the transaction and yep, then our and then system the sends step. it to the, yep, the funder yep. and the supplier? Right? Is that what happens? Yes. Okay, now bear with me. Stay, Just stay with me. I promise you, I'll get you where you want to go. I just need to... <laughs> I'm, I'm a very slow person, by the way, but if I get it, I'll help you a lot. So, okay, so this is red, this is, I'm, I'm making these in specific colors, I'll explain to you why later. But, you know, okay, so this, this is these guys. And then what happens is the funder, the funder needs to make an offer through your system like this, making an offer on these transactions, these invoices. And your system will then share these with the um, your system will share these with the with the supplier. Did I get that right, Paul? Uh, well, yeah, just everybody who's connected to the platform. So there's visibility rules on the data, right? So if the trans if the offer is related to a transaction that the buyer originally sent to us, they will be able to also see the offer. They yeah, can't but, accept it, but they can see it. But so it's, it's, it's shared with them, but yeah. But, it, but it's important for the supplier to see that offer so they can agree to it or decline, right? Yeah. Okay. So it, it's the in an a la carte scenario, it's the supplier that's accepted to actually do something with it. The buyer just has visibility of it. They're not expected to do anything with it. Does that's that right. Sense? That's right. I got gotcha. you. And this is your <laughs> buyer, by the way. This is a buyer. Okay. Now, the supplier Sorry. agrees, Paul, then what happens is, the supplier agrees, then what happens is the opposite of that. Right after this one, we can talk about the details of each, each process. I just need to agree with you on this piece, because that's what I call epic scenario. Um, so now, the supplier is going back and saying, I agree on this offer, so let's accept the offer. Accept offer. This, this is even called a happy path in your scenario because it looks like you have a lot of edge cases. But once you accept the offer, then you notify the funder. You basically go and say, let me tell the funder that this happened. Notify, no, sorry, notify funder, right? And then the funder in here will basically go and say, then pay the invoice. I'm going to they agree to my term so I'm going to pay it immediately so it's your funder basically pay through your system pay transactions through your system because this guy accepted it right and then later on the last step here is that your buyer will pay the funder through your system as well right Paul is that right yeah so the actual the payment processing is obviously done through a bank, but the information yeah. about that is, yeah, is yeah. given to us. Yeah. I understand. And yeah. ideally at some point in time, you can have your system run the whole thing, but some, some businesses will get a little itchy about the, you know, Oh, we just want you to manage the information, but we don't want you to see the actual capital. And that's okay. Yeah. I, I understand this mindset. Is this 
is this the happy path in your system, how you want it to be designed? That, that's one of them, yes. <laughs> Let's stick to that for now. Okay. Because one, one of the biggest things is that if you try to do everything at once, you'll do nothing. Hmm. Right? But let's stick to that system. <laughs> what I ask of you, though, you know what guardrails are? Do you know what these are? Guard <laughs> are, Guard we, are we using bowling metaphors now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so do, do guardrails. We're really scraping the bottom of the barrel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> So, <laughs> what do you say in England? Oi, oi, oi. oi it's Friday. That's what we Friday. say. Friday. Tuesday. <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> All right. Listen. So, here's the thing, though. Let's pick up this one piece together. If we were to implement this one piece, I'm going to put this in its own page because these are, this is the story. This is your story. This is your system. You're just going to have to be patient and we're going to get it done. Okay. So listen to me. My suspicion is that your buyer gives you data in the most garbage way you can imagine possibly in the world, right? Non-standardized, garbageized. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we we have um, a CSV standard that I I've, right. I've built myself. Um, yeah. The problem with that is that one, it's very new, um, mm -hmm. so there are probably a lot of cases that it doesn't cater for at the moment. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm gradually extend extending that with optional fields and things to to cater for different kind of variances as we go along. Yeah. Um, but also. Um, due to either limitations of the system or the way that we get the contracts as well so part of our unique selling point is look we mm -hmm. don't want to be a barrier to entry right mm -hmm. um you don't want to the, block them so you will work as hard as you can to make sense of it yeah so the, the, the problem that you get particularly with uh, again, it's a Fortune 500 and probably the next tier down level of, of company problem yeah. is that you go in, you speak to like the CTO and the CFO, you get them around a table. We have the most say, systems in the world. Uh, and they, <laughs> they, they they say stuff like that, followed by, oh, but we, we can't be really too flexible because of you know, <laughs> reasons. <laughs> so... <laughs> What, what is often happening is they already have some kind of like accounting related process where they're importing and exporting data to and from their ERP and accounting systems, right? So there's already some communication taking place there. Mm -hmm. So we say to them, look, we have a bare minimum requirement of a number of fields that we require, some set of, I think it's about 15 fields off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, and we say to them, look, if, if you can give us those 15 fields, um, we can do we can do this whole process. That's all we need. So I've built a CSV spec, which basically says these are those 15 fields. OK. And as long as you can provide them. I mean, to give you an idea of how bad. Right. Uh, how difficult would you think being a developer it is to say, give me what? represents the primary key or unique reference for an individual transaction mm -hmm. in your system it should be very simple but they would say well which part legacy current no 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 no, no. no, no. Mm. right what what they often do mm. and this is an erp thing right uh -huh. they get to the end of the financial year and they go right our primary key for journal entries is like um it's um a 10 digit alphanumeric key or something or no no it's numerical right it's an integer field okay but we've done a lot of business this year so we're getting close to that two billion mark so what mm. we're going to do is we're going to reset that to zero and we're going to start the new financial year <laughs> now this has not just happened with one client this has happened with multiple <laughs> clients so one of the key things in my spec is give us a unique reference for every transaction. And they go, yeah, 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 that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Comes down to it. They're not unique. They're not and unique. They, 
they, they wonder why their transactions are like making no sense in our system. They go, ah, I know what you've done. You've got, you've got SAP, haven't you? And they sort of nod knowingly and go, let me guess. What, SAP. what does that mean? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. So that's an, that's an easy problem to solve, though, Paul. But the one I wanted to ask you about. I've been thinking about this while we, we were talking. That's an easy problem. The thing that I that I'm grasping from you here. See, I'm gonna break each and every one of those, like each and every one of these pieces, into its own epic. Like it it does its own thing, and I'll explain to you why that's important. It'll help you visualize your deliverables really, really fast. But here's the question: Here, what I'm hearing you say is that this buyer is just chaos coming into your system. Here's chaos, let's say, non-standardized. Yeah, and we have this for every client. So yep, yep, imagine got you've you. got like 100 buyers all doing this. Yep. And what I'm thinking, now we're talking software right now at this point in time, is that you need a layer in here. And this layer is like an abstraction layer, right? And what this layer will do is, so, so there are there are three stages to this process that you're talking about. And these three stages are as follows, right? There is um, uh, this part where they provide you with the data. That's the, what was it? I had it in my head and then, okay. So they're giving you this, uh, there's the con con uh, c consuming data. So there is normal. To, to clarify, Hassan, um, this is a piece that I do in my workflow engine. So I take the garbage in, I parse it, doing a raw CSV parse. Yep, yep. We, we validate structurally that we can construct transactions from it. We construct transactions, and then I build what I call a transaction set. Mm -hmm. So that's a set of objects that are in our entity format internally. Once I've got a transaction set, that's the piece then from that point onwards that I think we should discuss because okay. um, I know you were keen to avoid certain aspects that might conflict with Microsoft yeah, yeah, technologies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so just, just stay with me on this one. I'm just yeah. trying, I'm with you, like I'm engaged with you right now. So just bear with me. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's, it's parsing, validation, entity construction, Data processing is essentially how I look at it. Four stages. Yeah, that's all inside the normalization process. The visualization is something else. I'll talk to you about that one. Okay, fair enough. I'm trying to find something that rhymes with ING at the end because I'm writing poetry. I'm not writing software. What is What is the part that consumes the data from the outside world called rationalizing no rationalizing is normalizing um uh, okay well i think of it as ingest or import but that's not an ing <laughs> importing i want, I want Im importing i like it importing so <laughs> importing normalizing visualizing i like it you're you seem to be good in english for once that's great <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I spoke it once, a long time ago. <laughs> then I met this guy. He, you should. I met, you, you should I met know this strange uh, American guy. He taught me Americanish. You, you should know that the Oxford Dictionary was mainly written by an American. Was it? Of oh, course. He was a lunatic. He wasn't a you know psych pen, ben, but he was actually. His name is Charles Minor. And we fixed it ever since, and we're still fixing it. <laughs> He was it was a Scotsman and an American, and um, you should watch uh, the Professor and the Madman. Do you do you watch? Net, do you guys have uh, Netflix in England? No, no, it hasn't reached here yet. Watch... The internet is a relatively new invention over here. We're still stuck in the stone age. <laughs> please, seriously, watch, <laughs> please watch the Professor and the Madman. Please, is watch that on that. there? It's there on there the... is. There is some uh, localization rules that Netflix has, but I'll I'll have a look. <laughs> I am one hundred percent. If you watch this, 
you'll understand something very interesting about the history of the English language. <laughs> let's let's go back to this though. So importing. You know they teach English in English schools, right? Yeah, of course. They teach Arabic in Arabic schools. They teach just, American, just checking, you know, Americanish in American <laughs> schools. Americanish. Did you <laughs> know that there are more? Let, let me tell you something, Paul. Wait, do you do, know do there Americans are... do Americans have English classes or do they have American classes? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious about this because English, of course, American so, English. So they. They say they teach English, but they don't. They teach you sidewalk, not pavement. <laughs> What's going on? Paul, let me ask you something. How do you feel if someone says, oh, just go on the pavement? That's just like... It's just normal. That's more like Lord of the Rings. Bring your <laughs> staff and pave the way. <laughs> anyway, listen. So, so, so here's the deal. So, okay importing normalizing visualizing right and this process my friend i'll come to you on that part i know you're saying you have something in place that does that but actually this normalization process and and hear me out on that one you know some of it is automatable and some of it mandatorily needs to be a configurable and manual yeah. So the, the problem with the sort of data that we're receiving is mm -hmm. we have validation rules that are things like um, a, a transaction is not valid unless it has at least one transaction line. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, but if I've got, say, um, a blob of CSV data, I can't guarantee that the lines for an individual transaction are say a contiguous blob in that csv data mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because i don't know what the client has sent us otherwise i would just say like stream process the file right because i could just go right okay generate a new header based on the first line and then just keep tipping in lines until i get a different transaction reference right um, and even even in the importing process i think you have other things and, and just hear me out on this one. You should allow people to natively use your portal to upload the data or integrate with whatever system they have, right? And then the last one is the manual manual entry. Like they send you a bunch of files, not through your system, but they say, here's what we have. They're not CSVs. Deal with it. Do you ever yeah. run into that scenario? Do they give you like none CSV files that your system doesn't know how to deal with and you have to kind of normalize it yourself? So we've built UI for like manual entry, but no one ever uses it. Um, Why? So because... because there's no need, right? Because it's, yeah. it's all done systemically. Um, we're kind of lucky in some respects because the sort of people, once the once the contractual side and the, the sort of like business side of it is all worked out at the sort of corporate level, mm -hmm. it then gets handed down to us grunts on the ground, so to speak. Um, and then, what, what, what do you do? Do you offer an, o, an API or do you just make a data dump? Do you give you just a bunch of files? Well, we, we have different companies that want different things from us. So that's, that's some of them will say, okay, we can make, say, um, a HTTP request to a REST endpoint to post data into that's your That's the document. integrate. That's this part. And then you have yeah. people that... Others make... will say, uh, hey, I just want to upload a file to an FTP server. Can you go and pick it up? That's you the know? manual. Yeah. yeah. And then you also have, you have the native where they go and say, I'm going to go through your portal or people that are just doing data dump, or you have people that are integrating with your API to actually, okay, is there any other way they can give you the data? I, I'd assume it's impossible. Either they give you the files, or they upload the files, or they integrate with your API to give you the files. Is that right? Uh, we, we have had out of band requests, such as like day to day, it's not normal that anything would be deleted from our system, but sometimes the client will make an error and they'll upload data that they don't want in the system. So they'll send us a file that doesn't really conform to any spec. And they'll say, hey, can you remove these from the system for us? And we'll go, OK, we'll have to process that. So yeah. that will then generate some out-of-band process type thing that we'll have to handle. Um, but 
who knows what we might get. Yeah, you know, that, we might that, get, say, an Excel spreadsheet or something with a whole ton of data in it, and then we'll be like, okay, what do we do with this? No, that's okay. I understand. I'm just trying to think of, and I think I named those wrongly, but you know, I I think I I think I understand. I think what so they either integrate this give you data dump or they actually use your portal and you said nobody's using your portal today but if you want to build that system to scale you want to keep yeah. that feature going okay got it yeah not for data entry certainly no they're, they're mo mostly using it for things like the offer acceptance to look at reports fancy charts and things like that yeah. and in um, the importing part you can dictate that data dump and put it into your system and your system might come and back and say, I don't know how to do this. So you need, it needs your manual intervention. Mm -hmm. Or you can figure your server, server, change the code, change some knobs to get it to work. Or you run an automation. It, it just figures it out. It just says, yeah, yeah, I figured it out. I can process this file. It's easy, right? Yeah, I mean, once the data is in our standard format, then the system just knows how to understand it, right? And can intrinsically translate into our entity yep. types and do whatever it needs to do with it. Um, so, so the trick is getting from what we've received to um, ensuring that it's definitely in our CSV line format. That's the normalization process. And yeah. the file is either already standardized or it requires a little bit of configurations or you have to manually intervene and fix something in the files themselves to actually fit in your system. Yeah, so the way the sales process effectively works is we say, here's our standard, can you meet it? And when the client says, yeah, 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 we can do that, they then start sending us um, test files, if you like. Say, mm. like we, we tried to build it, what does this look like? And we'll offer them corrections and things like that. And if it comes to a point where they basically say that that's as far as we can go, mm -hmm. um, is there anything you can do? At that point, we go, well, actually, yeah, if you give us these two extra fields or whatever, we'll figure out the rest for you and we'll transform what you're sending us in what we call a pre-transform mm -hmm. into our standard CSV format. And then our standard CSV format is what we transform into entities, essentially. And then ideally, when you share that data with people, mm -hmm. you know, the transaction, after you've done the transaction and did the work, when you share that data with people, I'm assuming that you will go and either offer a an integration mechanism where they can consume that data through an API or they can see it on your portal or you can just send them files. But I'm assuming you don't send people files ever because that's the point. You, you have a system, right? Yeah, I mean, we so his... And this uh -oh. is where history comes you actually into play send in files? the real world. Okay. Yeah. See, see, I don't know what you're doing, but I know a try nature in my head that drives me through the possible scenarios. But go ahead, tell me. Yeah. Mm. So this is where the real world comes into play. Sometimes you get people and they just say, look, we can't call your API or we won't call your API. We don't have time to do that. But if you give us a file in this format on an FTP server or something, um, we can pick that file up because we've already got systems for that. And part of the, the issue that we've got is that if you are talking to these big companies, they um, don't care. They'd be like, I yeah. don't care to integrate with your system. Just give me my transactions. Yeah. I mean, c consider the problem that we're solving for the fortune 500, right? When we're, we're not selling them anything, they're not making profit from this. Yeah. In, in the general sense. Right. Yep. So they don't immediately see the value in it. So from their yep. point of view, it's not worth them investing. Hiring an engineering team to integrate with your system, especially. Exactly. For, yeah, I know exactly what you're what you mean. Exactly. So you end up actually just packaging things up and manually either inserting it into their systems or find a way to integrate with their system. Yeah. So in the scenario where, for example, um, they're doing like an early discounting thing. So this is mm -hmm. where the, the buyer company is funding their own transactions. Mm -hmm. we, we might prep what we call a return file for them, mm -hmm. which is basically um, a slice of the data that has been accepted by the supplier in a format that they prefer. Mm -hmm. So for that, we will build a specific transform that would meet their specifications. And wow. our process will construct that for them and potentially then we can do things like we can post that to an api or we can yeah. dump it to an ftp server or whatever um, yeah the good I thing about our system is it's flexible and it can do 
whatever. You know, in the same way, you know, we've been talking about Odate and Neo, right? Yeah. Yeah. The idea is agnosticity, right? Yeah. It doesn't matter what you're talking to. It what it what matters is that you can open up a socket and you can pump data down it. Okay, so listen <laughs> to me, my friend. Here comes yeah. the part that you might probably have been probably waiting for. Mm -hmm. I will ignore these two parts for now intentionally. Okay. And I will sit down and we need to start talking about this part here, Paul. Because uh, this part here is where you turn your transaction into models in your system. And you need to build services that pick up that data that you already are sending in and map it into components and records that make so sure it matches your own internal standard schema do you want so, to talk about that go ahead go ahead i thought kind of the place that we would start would be um the model and the service layer of of dealing with the transactions once they were already in that modeled format we can work then out from the inside no no that's that's what i'm talking about like this guy here you already got the data yeah. And and you're normalizing it. Now you're ready. I'm not going to talk about I'm sorry. I, I might have been mis mistaken here, but I'm not going to talk about how you're going to turn the chaos into modeling. I want to say post as part of your normalization process, you have to create these models, right? I want to mm -hmm. talk about this what you just talked about, the yeah. models and how they get processed. So, yeah, so I've got um can I share something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, um, go for it. So I think I sent you this file, but yep. I can't see it the in massive, our chat history. The massive cul-de-sac like architecture. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, share screen. There we go. Uh, this one, I believe. Okay. So let me full screen this. Okay. Okay, so what I've got here is... Oh, I've boy, you're going to have to zoom in, brother. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. So uh, we'll start up here because yep. um, what I really want to talk about, I want to skip over this piece, okay? Yep. So this is the piece. So yep, yep, I've, yep. I've built my own workflow engine, and yep. I don't really want to talk about guts of what workflow does, yep. but that does the magic trick of taking in some file at this point the file is largely unknown i don't know what it is and turn okay. it into your models yep yep yeah so by discussion with the client's technical team um what i'm doing is i'm taking that and i'm transforming it into csv lines so csv lines contain type information about the type of transaction that it is some line information some set of references and some set of companies Okay, so these are all the things that we've talked about along the way. So companies, buyer, supplier, funder, mm -hmm. references, uh, the transaction reference, right? Um, in some cases, um, so the thing to bear in mind here is because we've got multiple people involved or multiple companies involved, right? The supplier will have a reference for a transaction. The buyer will have a, a different reference for that same transaction, potentially, and the funder will have another reference for that same transaction. So there's and, some... And, and that's okay. You shouldn't worry about that at all. You should just add it as additional details. Yeah. So I just wanted to highlight that what we receive in our CSV allows for that kind of thing to happen. Yep. And then we've got the line item, which is a, literally a line item like on an invoice. So that's like the thing being bought or sold or whatever. So what we do is we group them by the references. So that gives us what we call a line group. Okay. Yeah. And we take the line group and from that we build a transaction. Yeah. Which is consisted of a header, um, which has these these child collections essentially. Right. So we've got lines, references, companies, um, and we'll Look. we'll talk about buckets later. Yeah. But um what we do is we extract the company references and then we do an API request to go and figure out what buckets they live in and we generate that information. So at the point I'm talking about the stuff that we're designing, okay, we have this, which is a completely fully formed model that represents a transaction. 
Now I've got um, what I call a transaction set. So for a file, I'll have a collection of these. In mm -hmm. fact, I'll have multiple collections because what I do is, so for all the invoices, for example, I make a collection and for all the credit notes, I make a collection. Yeah. So I've got multiple collections and I bundle those up into something that I call a transaction set. And then mm -hmm. at the moment, I submit that transaction set to the API. Right. So th this is a massive background job that takes place in my back end to process that transaction set. Now, there's no reason why that has to happen. We can break That's... it down so that we only submit, say, a single transaction to the API. That's right. fine. Um, it, we just need to figure out what the design is from that don't point even, of view. Yeah, don't even worry about the, like the optimization. I, I want you to forget for a second about references and companies and buckets and line items, just for a second. Okay. You're going to come back to it. Naturally, we have to come back to it. Okay, so here's where we start to talk about process then. So yeah. the transaction set is sent to the API. Okay. Yeah. Or in this case, what I've done is I've modeled it out. I've simplified it. So I've said, okay, an individual transaction is sent to the API. And what we're doing with that transaction is we do some security check to confirm mm -hmm. that the transaction can be processed in the way that has been requested. Okay, We validate that transaction to ensure that that transaction is structurally correct and has all the, the relevant pieces that it needs. You know, It's mm -hmm. got line items, it's got references, et cetera, et cetera. We find the version of that transaction that may already exist from the previous process that ran yesterday in the mm -hmm. system. If it exists, we take the new version and we update the DV, DV version, preserving the primary keys already in the system. Yeah. Um, and then we spit that into the database. Okay. If it doesn't exist, then we just spit that into the database. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other piece then is the offer acceptance piece. Um, oh, um, what also happens is we compute something called an active transaction, but we can come back to that if you prefer. Just, just wait, Paul. You're, you're, you're jumping ahead. Um, yeah. The transaction when it comes in from the buyer, just bear with me. I promise you, I'll, I'll help you with it. But um, mm -hmm. the transaction when it comes to the buyer, it will, it should represent itself in, in, in three different format it, what do it you mean will, by that i'll tell you the transaction that comes from the buyer should transform into an offer when it's being viewed by the funder am i wrong no the, the funder is generating another. So, okay. So that there the are funder two. funder consumes the transaction and produces an offer for the supplier. The, the, okay. The, the best way that I can describe it is there, there are two types of transactions. Okay. So there, there are transactions that represent things that are being bought and sold. And there are transactions that represent effectively batches of transactions which are <laughs> right so mm. yeah and, and the reason why i say that is if you think about um so when we talk about payments the the conventional term used in the industry is what we call a remittance advice mm -hmm. um you remit essentially the the or pay the the things that are in the in the remittance advice so if you think about what's going on is Orders placed, invoices produced, some business process takes uh, takes place, right? Keeps happening, keeps happening, keeps happening. Get You get to the end of a what we call billing cycle, and then you go, right, what's outstanding? And the accounting team then goes, okay, we'll pay everything that's outstanding, yeah? So what they do is they bundle up transactions into a batch, which they call the remittance advice, and then they pay the batch. Um, but what actually happens from the banking point of view is they say, right, for all of this stuff, I'm making a transfer from account A to account B for this stuff. So from an accounting point of view, they're clearing down all of those line items. From a banking point of view, one transaction takes place. Let, let me ask you something. Why did you lump together 
everything under the word transaction. Um, Conception, because, mm -hmm. because when you actually look at it, if I come back over here, mm -hmm. um, I, I spent literally months and months and months. So the, the, the system that I inherited was this in a much more complex uh, fashion. Believe it or not, there's an ISO standard for defining a transaction. Nice. You I'm would not, not believe this. I'm not yeah. surprised. <laughs> the, yeah. the ISO standard is ridiculous. Like, if you can imagine, like, I mean, you've, you've obviously seen the OData spec, right? There's pages and pages and pages of it. Right? Yeah. That is a drop in the ocean compared to the definition of a transaction yeah, from an course. ISO. Point Financial view. systems are much older. Yeah. 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 So, what I did was I took the time to digest all of that information. And I said, okay, alongside that, um, what's actually going on here is there's some basic information that we need. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff that's defined in the spec that doesn't really matter. Now, the system that I inherited, as is what happens with pretty much every developer in the industry, right? Very few projects these days are Greenfields projects. Mm -hmm. um, you always inherit some big monolithic system that, for whatever reason, is folding under its own weight, essentially. Right. Um, it, it was modeled around that ISO standard which whilst it was structurally from a database administrator's point of view, it would be like the dream model because it had everything well-defined to a well-understood standard. I made the choice to deliberately denormalize in places and rip pieces out because all that mattered to me were the pieces that were actually relevant to this process. Mm -hmm. The general definition of a whole invoice is irrelevant if you don't use 70% of the fields, right? Right, right. So the only fields I have left is the stuff that are actually used every day in this process. So when I say um, a transaction consists of these parts, uh -huh. so you can see I've, I've deliberately colored these things slightly different. So um, you've talked about like, um, I can't remember the exact terms that you use, but we have primary and secondary entities, right? Yep, yep. So the primary entity in this case is the header. That represents the transaction. So that's the invoice or credit note or the, um, you could have an offer or you could have a remittance advice. They all have this in common. They all have a header. Yeah. They also all have line items. So these are the things that are on it. But These are secondary. And, they can't exist without this primary self-sustaining entity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So, um, but with an invoice, the line items are, you know, this amount of stuff, this value kind of thing. With an offer, the line items are this transaction reference, this face value, and where the transaction reference goes to a reference on another transaction. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, and because of that, you know, the buyer can have a reference, the supplier can have a reference, the funder can have a reference for a single transaction. References are also a collection, much like line items. So this is how I've ended up with that structure. The companies, obviously, the buyer, the supplier, the funder, it's a collection of related companies that are connected to that transaction. And I have a, I have a question about references, Paul. You know, are you having a collection of references for the same transaction. Yes. Because to the same transaction for every, so every, let's say actor in this process, like your buyer, funder, and supplier, right? Are, are each one of them having a different reference because these are references that are relevant in their local systems? Or why are you giving them different references? I know you probably so, said that already, but explain it, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, again, it comes back to this problem of the real world, right? Mm -hmm. So, in, in the real world, um, mm -hmm. companies send you data that they have in their system. Yeah. What they don't do is they don't query your API yep. to figure out they, what your give primary you their value reference. is. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what we've done is we've said, look, the client, in our case is the primary citizen, if you like, mm -hmm. in our system. And so yeah. from a from a tenant 
point of view, what we do is we say, okay, we're going to build a data model, which is a true reflection as much as we can reasonably do it of your mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. And we're going to treat your primary keys as our primary keys in that's as a many bad, places. That's a bad decision. Well, in as many places as we can reasonably. However, there are exceptions to that. So primary entities, for example, have a primary key in our system. The secondary entities, like the references, um, we prefix their system ID and we suffix their reference and we say that is a unique reference. And then we say, right, that is the primary key for a reference that's attached to a header in our system. What this allows us to do is from an OData point of view on the API, when we're asking questions, we can directly ask a question by a primary key value in that references table to get a direct question back for a specific invoice, which is an often an encountered problem from a UI point of view, but also generally from a business process point of view. Imagine you've got like a random supplier on the phone. You have no idea who they are. We don't directly deal with them. They're, they're a client of our client, so to speak, right? You got them on the phone. They're saying, I've got this transaction reference. Oh, blah, 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 blah my problem. And you're like, geez, okay, how do I handle this? What's your transaction number so I can find it for you, right? Something like that. But, right. but the, now, the if, they give us, if they give us a transaction number, what is known as a number, okay, is the VAT reference for a transaction in the accounting system that it was produced. Yep. Well, if you can imagine in our system, because it's a multi-tenancy system, if I search for a number, what I'm going to get back is 100 transactions. I'm going to go, well, which one of these are you talking about? Right? So, so, so hear me out. Hear me out on this one. Yeah. I don't think you should partially or fully use your external client primaries as your primaries ask uh, me why just just ask me why tell me cool. why why if you do that my friend mm -hmm. you're giving your first of all i call that model leakage like your external models are leaking into your core system like they're dictating how the operational uh, keys in your system work from their side. That yeah. basically means they can break your system at any time if they duplicate records or they send you two different transactions because of a problem in their system. Just, just play with me for a second. Yeah. So imagine this. I was at some point in time. I had to integrate with SAP. SAP is garbage, you know? That's just what, how it is. No, really? So I, I can't so, believe that. So, so, just, so just hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me out. <laughs> no one's ever said that in the history of IT, right? Hear me out. So, oh, wait. <laughs> hang on a minute. <laughs> something very common. One of the things that I always say to people is that true software engineering is building a perfect system that can tolerate a neighbor imperfect systems. There's a funny joke about that in terms of context because from the other people's perspective, their system is perfect and yours is not. But that's a that's a story for another day. If you allow, just hear me out, just you're still storing that data, but it doesn't have any operational primary capability other than querying. And it's not primary in any way, shape, or form. So we're not storing them as primary keys on primary entities. We're but you, storing them as primary on, keys on, on secondary on entities second, still, with, it's, it's still, with a business rule applied. Right, but, you're, but, but think about it this way. What if they send you another transaction that has the same key? What do you and do? And it's the same transaction. Even if it's actually a different transaction, do you throw the error? Yeah, because the, if you think about what we're receiving, right? If if they say, okay, transaction one, two, three, this value, right? And then a week later, they say transaction one, two, three, this value. Mm. As far as we're concerned, they're updating us. They're telling us that that transaction is now in a different state. This is, this is an agreed business rule that we have with every client. Okay. 
So th this is a standard and it's part of our sales pitch. We basically say, hey, what you give us, if, if you screw up your data, it will be screwed in our system. But what we're doing is we're saying, look, if your data makes no sense, when we share it with the third parties that you want us to share it with, it will make no sense to them. And this is why we go into these clients and we say to these CFOs, we're going to break your systems because we're going to show you where it doesn't work. And, and this is one of those areas. If, if they have a business process that makes no sense, then so this is part of the reason why we have this concept of what we call a system ID, mm. which is it, it's basically the source system from which we received that file. So we can differentiate, let's say we've got um, a buyer and it's broken down into say, I don't know, we, one example that we have is one of our buyers has 32 different divisions or sub companies, if you like, uh -huh. um, and they each have an SAP instance, okay? And they each send us transactions. And those transactions um, will have IDs that overlap, right? Because yeah. each of those is effectively a different company. Yeah. So the way that we differentiate between them is we say, okay, this one from system ID one has transaction one, two, three. And this mm -hmm. one from system ID two also has transaction one, two, three. Mm -hmm. Those are different references and mm -hmm. we can differentiate that. And we look at that and we go, okay, because that's a different reference, that's also a different transaction. Mm -hmm. However, if within say just division one, they do the classic SAP thing where they get to the end of the year and they reset the ID to zero and then they mm -hmm. send us transaction one, two, three again. What do you do? You update. With that, yeah, without prior knowledge of what what is going on there. And this is where I get involved in what we call pre-transform. Yeah. So what we do here is we say, okay, we know that the client is breaking our rules because what they're putting in that unique reference field in our CSV is not unique so we'll do things like we'll prefix the financial year to their reference and we'll say that's their reference but we agree that with them ahead of time it's part of the business process but so now but where... now you're changing your system no no so the system processes our standard csv and it takes that and it transforms it into the entities that i'm sharing on screen now and those entities are what they are right Mm -hmm. the, the system always works the same way, always behaves the same way with those entities. Prior to all of that... You have to do the additional work of normalizing that data to make it processable and consumable. Exactly. Right? And that's and where the, you append the, the, yeah. the, 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 the financial year and all that. Yeah. So th the rules of that are going to be largely per client, and there's no way we can avoid that unless every client is super strict about meeting our standard. So our standard is this CSV standard. And under that standard, we're saying, hey, all of your references must always forever be unique. But we know that clients are just they can't stick to that. Yeah. yeah. They just they can't never, do it. Yeah. Yeah. So what we do is we say, hey, I've I've built a system here where we can take this black box information. And as we agree new business rules with you, because we've identified that your system is broken in some way mm -hmm. or doesn't follow the rules of our system, mm -hmm. we can prefix to that dynamically a blob of C sharp that exists purely in the workflow engine, essentially, is dynamically compiled into something and then executed prior to pumping that into our actual transactional database. So nothing hits our database until it's an entity. We don't import the client's raw data. We always pre-process it. No, no, I I understand. You're normalizing. You're picking the data and you're 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 transforming the data. But the problem. Let me ask you something. On their system, on their system, Paul. Yeah. How how do they distinguish between transaction ID zero? and transaction ID zero in two, in two different fiscal years? They don't. What do you mean? How do they keep their data then? They, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm assuming what they do, um, I've heard that from a couple of our clients, what they effectively do is at the end of the financial year, they take a complete backup of the SAP database and no. then they just start again. No, I don't buy it. That's not true. 
I, I don't buy it. <laughs> I'll tell you something. Something else is going on that gives them a unique reference. Yeah, and they're not sending us that. Uh, and we've told them, hey, we need that unique thing. But they don't but, understand. Yeah. They think it's a secret, a super secret thing. If they gave it to you, they expose internal information. Yeah, and but also part of that problem is maybe that field is not easy to get hold of because, you know, what they're basically doing is they're using, like, SAP's UI, and SAP doesn't give them that option or something. It's garbage. It's a piece of garbage. Um, okay. <laughs> so. No, come on. <laughs> Not SAP. Let, let me let me tell you something. Um, so, so um, I would love to build my own like um, accounting and ERP systems that I would bolt onto this, and it would follow like strict, well understood rules. But I think then I'd have to solve like the the problem of scale, right? Because when you're doing yeah. business at that level, the the rules are so complicated. Um, not, not just that, but like I said to you, your your engineering is to coexist with imperfect systems, not to go rebuild the universe. Exactly. Yeah. In, in an ideal world, we'd own the whole process end to end. We go yeah. into a company and we say, right, you're going to onboard with us and you're not going to use anything else. Yeah. But, but no but company has that, right? No company will agree simply because <laughs> you also you also have these 25 year in the company super users. Yeah. That will not learn something new. Yeah. And you're just going to have to use a system. And if they quit, the whole company will crumble like a domino. Just a bunch of dominoes. Just do, 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 just like that. So, so, the, so The other way to look at it, though, is that mm -hmm. SAP is basically like .NET. Yeah. You can build good things in it and you can build bad things in it. Yeah. Um, but it allows you to build bad things. And go what go ahead and see. What yeah, we go, often see as mm -hmm. consumers of that. Is yep. we're seeing all the bad choices that have been made. We're not seeing the good ones. Go ahead and create custom fields because the last name can only be 14 characters. <laughs> so create, create last name two, last name three, last name four. So, 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 so okay. Not, not that it's something real I've ever dealt with or anything. You know, we're just, you know, imagining things. Never happens, so, does it? Yeah. So, this is all hypo, hypothetical. You know what I mean? I'm just trying to think with you here because this is really important. Like, mm -hmm. I really want to prevent you from allowing an external system to have that much power in your internal system through your keys, even if it's a secondary entity. What power do you think that they've they've got here that I'm granting them? Because all I'm basically doing is I'm saying, hey, there is a, a primary key. It's an ID field. It's going to have something that is generated in our system and then a separator, like a pipe. Um, and then it's going to have some value that comes from the client system. And that's going to be indexed in such a way that it's quick to search. And I'm always, whenever I do a search on that field, I'm always searching for um, the system ID pipe then contains something that in a search term on a, on a UI or something like that. Let, let, let me tell you what kind of power they have. You said it yourself. You said that... And and I hope I'm not bothering you with these questions, Paul. I really want to discuss no, this with you. It, it's interesting to get an outside point of view, basically, because like I'm stuck in my own little world, basically trying to face this problem day to day, and actually getting you know like your input on it. It's kind of interesting because you're in a unique position, I think, with particularly with working with Microsoft. When you go into a company, you say, "Look, we're technical leaders in." the it market right mm -hmm. you will do as i say because yep. i am micro you, you know you're with representing that. microsoft right yep. <laughs> when when i go into a company and i say hey you need to do things this way they're like, well, like you who, know. who are you yeah 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 so yeah. It, it's a different way of looking at things now there are certain negotiations that simply by you taking that attitude with them the client will just fold and they'll go yeah no worries. Yeah, they'll be like, "We're not going to work with you." It's really yeah. stupid, and then you lose market. So, so let me let me just tell you: you you made a statement that just confirms my doubts. You basically said, "If you provide us with broken data, we're gonna we're gonna provide your funders and suppliers with broken data." You said that, right? Yeah, I mean, it's within a, a degree of of like 
So if, if we know what the rules are for fixing that, we'll fix it. But if we don't know what the rules are, we can't fix it. See, that's the thing, right? So they have enough power to let data seep through your system, mm -hmm. even though it's wrong. And because they have that hand in some of your primary operational keys, they will make your system look bad in front of your funders and suppliers. It's not our system. What the supplier sees is our client's corporate branding on it. From that, their point of view, what they're seeing is the client. I understand, but it's still your your Paul's system. Yeah, yeah. So don't don't worry about the branding and the stuff that uh, the folks with MBAs and the salespeople <laughs> will say. Don't worry about that. We're talking about our system. We're building this system here. So from an operational point of view, my system won't break. It will just show the bad data, right? Right. And so it will say, hey, there's some bad data that's been imported here. And then the supplier will obviously question that with the buyer. And then the buyer will go, oh, yeah, we made a mistake. And then the following day, we'll, it will receive a new file that will have that correction in it. Is this mistake something as simple as someone misinserting their last name or is it something yeah. as massive as oh we put a reference that belongs to a different transaction due to how these things work it's to my okay i have never seen like um data that's crossed between transactions never like in the maybe faulty data poll like they put in a transaction id that was already inserted but it belongs to a different transaction yeah so you you said knowledge... it yourself the reset for the new year and if it wasn't for you appending it by the fiscal year you're screwed right um yeah but that's that's an agreed systemic failure in the rules right um so what we're saying is hey Okay, when we do go to the client, we say to the client, look, all of the references like for a transaction must be globally unique. And we, we say that that is a business rule. Okay, now you, you can't function into. Okay, the way that I explain our system is that it is the, the bit of business process between business processes. Yep. You've got a system that has business process. Your, I got a system core, that has your business core process. services. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're connecting two business processes together. Okay. Mm -hmm. The only way that that can work is if those two systems actually agree some fundamentally basic rules. And one of those basic rules is a reference is unique. And, and there's just no way of getting around that. Right. That you have to function on the basis because. If you think about it, when we get a question from a supplier or when we get a question from a funder, they're going to give us the buyer's reference or they're going to give us their reference. Right. And they're going to say, hey, this transaction doesn't look right. And then they're going to pose their question. OK. At the end of the day, it boils down to if the data is just bad, they're going to pose a question and we're going to say, yeah, it looks like bad data. And then what's going to happen is that that company or that person from that company is going to go and talk to the other person at the other company. Mm. And then some correction is going to be made. See, that's a, see, that's, that's a literally the point of our system is to find those problems and have people correct them. So, so the question is why your system isn't finding these problems automatically and blocking it from, from the get go. Let me tell you because, why that's okay. There's a difference between a problem that makes a transaction effectively structurally wrong, so it can't even be parsed. So in that situation, it will just never hit our system. No, that's what that's, happens that's, is we raise a validation error for that, and we give a report to the client, and we say, "Hey, we couldn't import this because it's garbage." Yeah, yeah. There's but, a difference between that and okay, this data doesn't quite look right, which is just input errors. That's what I'm saying. You have three levels of validation, structural, logical, and external. The yeah. logical validation should catch that. Um, Let, there, me tell you why it's important. Let me tell you why it's important. If your transaction has to wait with its bad data all the way until it gets to the supplier, that's a missed opportunity for your supplier to get funding, right? Um. Let's say it took three days. 
it, it, okay, so what should happen is the the transaction is obviously sent from the supplier to the buyer, and then I don't know how long the process takes, but then f until we receive it, there's not a lot we can do about it. But and that's literally okay, as soon but... as we receive it, we import it. Right. So that so that so it, it went from the supplier to the buyer. And the buyer started giving you these transactions. So hopefully a funder will take an offer and pay for these transactions, right? The invoices, right? Right. But the supplier can see that transaction as soon as we've received it from the buyer before the offer is generated. And, th and that's okay. Now, let's say the supplier gave the buyer transaction A and your buyer gave your system A plus instead of A. Okay. Right. Or, or, or one and they give you one, two bad reference right okay if your system doesn't catch that the turnaround time of catching these errors and the manual interventions do you know how you do you know how so, you measure counter question right uh -huh. how do i check that a primary key in a remote system is correct that's a great question so you have you have a couple of things though First of all, I, I'm I'm gonna fight you on this. I know it's your system and your world, but I'm still gonna fight you over it. Don't. I was give... expecting this. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> no, Come no. on, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 here's the deal. You know, there are some things about this process that you are not going to like, and they are just they're either unsolvable problems or they require a name like Microsoft to be able to bully a company into conforming to a standard. And that just doesn't happen when you're a company like we are. I mean, mm -hmm. there's like 10 of us that run the whole company. We're a very small company, but we're doing this. This is big business. Yeah, you know, We're in a very unique position because I've got such a level of automation on this system. It's very yeah. low maintenance, generally yeah. day to day. Yeah. And so the net result is I can do, you know, I can run, I think last time I checked, I can run something like a billion euros worth of data through the system like nice. daily without any problems. Nice. You know, so, so let me just go back to this one. You, 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 made, you, you made a question, right? You said, okay, they have a remote reference. Yeah. There's no way for me to know whether that reference is, is good or bad. Yeah. So imagine on, it's, like, it's the first time I've ever seen that reference, right? I take mm -hmm. it and I go, great, you've given me a reference. So I import mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Now I see that reference again the following day and I go, great. Okay. So you're updating that transaction, you're updating. are you? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How do I know that the second time I saw it, that wasn't actually that transaction? I, I, was, I can, I can how do I differentiate basically between a genuine update and actually something's gone horribly wrong here? Now I, I know the correct answer to this. Go first. No, no, no. I want to see if you can figure it out. If you provide every transaction with a unique, um, with a unique ID that's local to your system, while keeping that reference as additional details, not operational primary key, even yeah. on your secondary models, every day they're going to send us their data only. They're never going to send us our data. No, I understand. So, I if I generate a primary key for a transaction that I received yesterday. Today, when they send me that data again, they're not going to send me my primary key. Okay. So I can't use that as part of my that. validation. I okay? know that. So the, so my... the data that we're showing on screen now, right? When I've built all of this, it's only populated with the raw data from that CSV import. It doesn't contain anything from my system other I, than the. I promise you, I get it. Just okay. hear me out. Go for it. So, <laughs> if you give every transaction, every reference that's coming in, even if it's not unique to its yesterday, a, a local unique identifier. Yeah, we do. Can, but, 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 but your local unique identifier is transformed partially dependent on the reference that your client is giving you, right? Every transaction has a local primary key. In Sorry, the reference ID. The the reference ID, yeah, is is globally unique in our system. Because you're appending it by the fiscal year, right? No, we're appending it with a system ID. 
So it's it's considered to be globally unique from the source system that it came from. Okay. So let's say you're dealing with a buyer that's, you know, John, right? I and C, and the buyer is giving you a transaction with the reference one, two, three. Mm -hmm. And then the next day they're giving you a transaction with reference one, two, three. Mm -hmm. Right. What does your system do today? It says this is an update, right? Your yeah. system, just stay with me. No, no, just stay with me. Your system yeah. will say this is an update, right? Yeah. Okay, but it may not be. Yeah. Well, how do I tell the difference? That's I know the thing, that's isn't it? that's what I'm trying to get you to. I have a solution, and you wouldn't tell me your solution, but I'll tell you mine, right? Yeah. Why don't you? Why don't you? So, 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 let me ask you this: Why does your system think? It's an update because your system has that same transaction ID as primary somewhere. Yes. The so okay so on day one they send me the transaction one two three one two three I, I generate a primary key I put it in the system. What what does this primary key look like? Your system ID plus that ID one two three right? Okay. Let Let's say I generate a GUID, right? And sure. I put. And I put the thing that I currently generate as the primary key in the references table, I put that in another field. Yeah. And, and I just index it. Yeah. So I can still use it for my searching reasons, yep. but I've got a separate primary key. Yep. And then you okay. got another one that's one, two, three. Okay. I get another one tomorrow. Yeah. It, or today from the previous transaction that I received. Okay. I now have identified in my system that these two references now match. So I'm treating that as an update. Whether or not that extra primary key exists the result is logically the same you shouldn't do you know what you should do what you should keep them both and make it a part of your final transaction that you display to your end user uh the problem with that is that most clients send us a snapshot every day That's so okay. we're going to have we're going to have 60 copies of every transaction in our system you should because have to you should have two copies of the same transaction. No, no, we're going to have 60 because when a transaction is produced, standard payment terms across most of Europe, which is where the bulk of our business is done, um, carries a maximum payment term limit of 60 days. So we're going to receive those transactions on repeat for 60 days until they're cleared. Okay, so hear me out. Then you need to have two versions of the same transactions. A, a trace version and a calculated version. So what, what we do at the moment mm -hmm. is whenever anything happens to a transaction, we append to the piece that's missing here is that there's actually another child collection that's attached to the header, Yikes. which um, the system doesn't actually um, produce from the raw CSV data, which is why it's not shown here. But further down the process, when we start doing things like putting stuff into the database, mm -hmm. what we're actually doing over here is prior to that insert into the database, we attach an audit entry to mm -hmm. that thing to say, hey, this thing was updated today by user X. What, what so about that, what, what, where do you store the record where it was yesterday before you did that update? Do you have like temporal tables? We don't. You just don't store it. Okay, so let me stop you right there. Yeah. Create two versions of every transaction. Okay. One, one that is two? What about on day three? What do I do? Keep, keep appending these traces. And I'll tell you why. Because this way, your end user will go and say, okay, this is my final copy of what I believe to be updates. But if you believe that this value is incorrect, let your end user use your system to go and say wait the transaction that came through on day three was actually unique and let them click a button and detach that that trace from that version and spin up an, a new transaction with a completely new version in your system the way that we do that at the moment we can achieve the same result by the client correcting the problem on their end so they would give us what the state of that transaction is that they want, and then they give what, us the state of the second transaction that they want in the CSV data. And, and how, do they, how do they four, know that would be the state? But how do they know? 
about the 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 supplier tells them this is wrong, right? Yeah. So now they're 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 communicating out of your system, which puts your system in a bad state. Well, the 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 supplier and the buyer are interacting with our system daily. No, I so understand. the buyer may spot issues in our system, and then then they'll go, "Oh, what did we send them?" And then they'll look at the raw data and they'll go, "Ah, that was wrong." Why don't Why don't you let your supplier look at these transactions and say, "No, sorry, this is a unique transaction." Yeah, we can potentially do that. Um, you'll You're end in... up with row explosion, and your database size will grow. In our case, by like you know sixty times bigger. Not not if not if you enable temporal tables. It's optimized for that. You don't actually have to programmatically do that. You're just keeping track. H have you played with temporal tables at all? Okay. No. I I need I need to create a I'm going to create a video just for you. I've oh, been actually putting tables. that on I've been putting that on hold. It's literally one line of code that you enable in your in your uh, entity framework setup, one line that mm -hmm. says is temporal. And all it does, Paul, it creates a new table in a special place, not in the normal entity tables. It creates a new, do you want to see it? Do you want me to show you? Let we should see. probably um, we should probably take that offline. We'll do your video first, and then we'll have well, another discussion well, about it. I'll do, a, I'll do a video first, but just hear me out. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you give your consumer from the other end, your supplier, the final version of the transaction and the trace version of the transaction so they can still communicate through your system. Mm -hmm. Hear me out on this. If people go, if I, at some point in time, I was building a system where people enter data and then they go send emails to each other outside of that system, right? Mm -hmm. And it was an auditing system, like a financial system like this one. It wasn't financial, but it was legal system. So all of these communications were lost. You have no idea how that decision came to be. So what did I do? I created a communication channel inside my system. Okay. And this communication channels by them going and saying, wait a second, this transaction that was happening on 1-1-2021, I want to put a note on it for revert or for branch, branch out into a completely new transaction. Would that help okay. or no? You don't think so? Um, I mean, today, I, don't, I don't think I don't think it's a particular business problem that we we face today. But I can actually see the value in it. Yeah, because from a like say from a UI point of view, they can look at the details of an individual transaction, and then they can have like an other versions grid or something, and then they can expand into that and start yeah. drilling through the history of it. Essentially, how is that going to help you? And how is that going to help everybody involved in this? The turnaround um, time. The turnaround time in actually yeah. fixing a transaction like this is going to be much shorter. Yeah, I think it's one of those like in a situation where something weird has happened, it will be invaluable. But those things, because of the way that our, our processes are designed, are extremely rare. Like the biggest problems that we have with transactions tend to typically be like, oh, this value is wrong. You know, and then like the buyer will go and update it in their system and the following day it'll be right again. And then they'll get a correct offer on it. Mm. Or it will be like, oh, where's the credit note that should be attached to this? Because, you know, the, the offer, you know, the offer value is too high because it hasn't been credited for the ton of spoiled milk. I Ideally, you should have a state at some point in time where all the parties involved are communicating solely through your system even though they sign contracts outside of your system. Because if you if you integrate blockchain smart contracts into your system, the, the signature will happen on your system. You become the source of truth in this case. But but okay, th you said this You're is an elegant. Yeah, you said you said this is an edge case. The the other thing is I want to reconceptualize with you these models that are coming from this line group. I think you're right, though, because like at scale, because um, in particular, the problems that we've had at the moment are relatively small because we've had a relatively small sort of, if you like, surface area in that we're not serving very many people in the world. Right. Wait, wait till you hit a couple of billion dollars, 27, 28, 20, 30 billion dollars business and you'll see this scale up real fast. 
becomes yeah. a problem. So mm -hmm. when you get to that level, that kind of like diagnostic information becomes invaluable, doesn't it? And I've gone to great lengths to try and make the system um, give me lots of, if you like, additional detail on exactly what happened. So at one point I had an interface that I could just whack onto any entity. Um, and it, it basically behaved the same way as temporal tables as mm -hmm. uh, from what I've understood from what you've described. Yep. I've not really dealt with them much. But it basically just, it just what it would do is... All the changes you do to a record automatically. It, it did exactly that, yeah. Yep. So it would write them into an audit trail. Yep. Um, yep. What I found was my audit trail just exploded. Yep. And I had like That's millions and millions and millions of rows. And then it yep. just became unmaintainable. So I ripped it all out and I basically yep. said, no. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add an audit entry against the transaction that basically just says, hey, this was updated today by, you know, buyer or by supplier or whatever. But and, you don't um, know exactly what, what changed. Um, <clears throat> well, most updates are of um, a particular kind of type, if you like. So um, what happens is like, um, you know, like 99.9% .9 of all the data that we look at, right? The update is like, Oh, yeah, it's now been approved. Yesterday it was held. So the actual audit entry that we log was was approved. Um, and literally all that's changed is like a state field on the row. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in, in a scenario where you've got like the whole transaction has been updated because reason, some mismatch in the buyer system it would be nice to have the old and the new like in the, in that temporal fashion. So then you could, yeah, you could highlight that in the UI and be like, hey, this is out of the ordinary, right? So I could build UI that basically says, hey, something weird happened here. Buyer, go and approve some sort of, you know, resolution to this or just say, yeah, this was expected, um, you know? And so we can build like a UI that basically says, these are things that we're, we're questioning as, as you know, my company is that, as the broker right. in the middle right sorry <laughs> does that make sense yeah 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 i hear it um let's let's reconceptualize these models and let's build services that supports your persistence process do we have to build that into the models it sounds like it's just a switch on the actual database construction right oh for temporal tables yeah it's just a switch Okay, so how does that affect, for example, like the the OData endpoint? Presumably, I still request my transactions as normal, but then do I get something alongside that, like a temporal set? You don't, but you can. Like you can, you can expand and extend into that. I'll do a video about it. You're gonna love it. It's gonna blow your mind. Yeah, that you wouldn't be really believe cool. why you would you wouldn't believe why one line of code could mm -hmm. do all of that. But anyway, and one, of the, one of the guys that um, works in my team, he, he's basically turned around and said, yeah, it'd be really cool if, um, and this is an idea that I've had for some time as well, is when we import the transactions um, attached to the header, we take like the raw blob of data from the CSV file, that line group that we produced it from, uh -huh. and we, we put that in there as well. Uh -huh. um, so we can say, hey, this raw data produced this transaction. Yeah, and what, what people do today, they do something really crappy. Like they go and say, let me log the, 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 the transaction that changed my data. And they actually log the entire object. The problem with that yeah, is, is, yeah, it's, this is, I've seen a lot of people do that, and it's really wrong. The reason for that it's wrong is because I don't think people quite understand, or maybe it's a, it's a common misconception. They think that logging is for storing historical data changes. That's really wrong. If you see someone do that, tell them on my behalf, you're wrong. Your logs... People don't understand the difference between logging and auditing. That's, that's they, my understanding. Is is, that... See, this is why I like you a lot, because you understand <laughs> these concepts. See, that's the thing. Logging is supposed to give me the story of what happened. It's yeah, not but it's it's more of a real time thing, though, isn't it? You don't keep your logs forever. You keep your only three trails. months. Yeah. It, the biggest companies in the world will tell you here is ninety days 
and get rid of that immediately. Let me tell you where it bites people in the butt, you know, when they store data in there. Do you know what happens? It ends up having that data, including what we call PI. Yikes. And PI is supposed to be masked at rest. So you're not supposed is to... Is that your processing information? Is that right? No, no. PI is, is payment information. Oh, okay. So imagine you're, you're putting in some app insights, someone's social security number, credit card number, you know, date of birth, in your logs, in your logs, right? Now... I get very angry when people log details like that. Because it, it's it you're not me off. Because so, that's such a, like it's just such a simple thing, and you're going to get shot in the foot from like PCI compliance, uh, you sure. know, and, uh, and other kind of like compliance. standards. You should not be logging sensitive anything. You, you know, so so what people say is that oh, we we can log it as long as we mask it. Well, if you mask it, then you're not, there's no way for you to. <laughs> So anyway, let's go, let's just go back to this piece. I really appreciate that you have this common understanding with me because my logs are supposed to be telling me you went from Germany to England. So it's telling me that Paul went from Germany to England. It doesn't tell me what was inside Paul's car while he's traveling from Germany to England. That's not what this is for, okay? What is supposed to tell me that is the auditing, the police officer that's standing at the border and is telling you, let us check your belongings and let's take notes of it. That's the auditing. That's the best I can describe it. But anyway, Let's go back to this yeah. one. Logs, logs are generally available. So, like, you know, anyone could – freedom of information, right? Yeah. So any anyone can request, like, data about what the police know, for example. Literally. They contain they contain the log. Yes. But if, if there's further inquir inquiries required, then a court summons it's can request the invest. audit trail. Yeah. So, and that's what contains the details of exactly what happened. You should not right. be putting your audit detail in your log because then yeah. you're giving away your sensitive information. And and really. in your distributed systems, what people do, they share something called a correlation ID. And this ID travels with your requests. From the moment it gets generated, only the generator, the original generator of the request is the one dictating that correlation ID. And it keeps traveling across all your microservices. And this way, when you go to your logging, you know exactly that this ID, this unique identifier, is the, the request that was traveling. But you don't know what's inside of it until you go to the temporal tables, go to the database tables, and do auditing. This is really important. Mm -hmm. Now You're starting to break up a bit, Hassan. Me? Can you hear me? I, I can hear you, but you, you're getting like a glitch in every like tenth word. <laughs> this this thing, this, the these uh, these foldable phones have very strong signal. When I was talking to the Verizon guy, I was telling him, "Hey, I need to buy a hotspot because I sit outside a lot on my laptop." And he said to me, "Don't you have the the Z Fold?" I said to him, "Yes." He said, "This is the strongest hotspot you can buy." Nice. Yeah, yeah. So, so they interrupt the signal so much so that they interrupt the signal. Like if I put my phone next to my mouse like this, it starts to cut out. <laughs> can, can you, so you need a crap of phone, is what you're saying? Yes. <laughs> I, I need. I need to break that phone. Can you still hear me now? Am I cutting out now? I seem okay. Okay. We'll, we'll work. We'll work for it. It's fine. <laughs> okay. Tell me if it cuts out because it's really important. But um, let's let's just go back to this piece. So, okay, assume that you normalized your data and your data is coming in. Would you would you be willing to discuss how you created your models and maybe think about how we can shift them around? Let's just discuss it at least. Like you said, I have lines and references and companies and buckets, but that's your mo modeling aspect. I want to know why. I think if there's a if there's a decent business reason for restructuring the model, I'm I'm open to it. 
Um, however, what I was trying to do on by approaching you initially was to mm. make sure that my my code base, the actual processing side, the business logic, was architecturally correct from the point of view of like um, the standard. Yep, Once we got on that far, that. my plan was to then improve the model, you know, as 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 time went on. But it's one of these things where, like, if you think that um, the model is going to prevent us writing good business logic, then potentially it's worth considering. What I don't <laughs> want to do is go back to my team and say, hey, guys, we've got to throw everything out. and We're going to create a completely new system from scratch. What I'd like to be able to do is say, OK, we're going to rip out this set of services and we're going to plonk these new ones in, which are going to perform the exact same function, just better. Let's talk about the services then. Yeah. Um, I, I do agree with you, though, that there is some potential there um, for adjusting the data model. And, and I think that that is potentially something, certainly in the longer term, that we, sh we should look at. But we should start with the business logic, I think. I so, 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 so let me ask you this. Every time your would, – would your buyer send you anything other than invoices? Well, as I said, they send us invoices, they send us credit notes, they send us remittance advice lines, um, and the funders are sending us offer information as well. So we, we, we've got those are essentially our four primary, if you like, transaction types. The and those within them, those within them have types as well. So, like an invoice can be a sales invoice or a debit note. Does that make in, sense? Yeah, invoice, remittance, offer, and what was the fourth one that you had? Credit, credit note. Credit note. Yeah. And each one of those have lines and references and companies and buckets, like you call and, it, right? And and an audit trail, yeah. So they have five collections on them, essentially. And, and this is like a standard across all collection types. And I made the silly mistake of building a base generic transaction class where you pass in each of those collection types as generic parameters long time ago. Um, and now what I'm trying to do is unpick all of that because I built um, I built the object model like that and then I built the service model like that. So and now, now I've got services with all these. Yeah, it, it's, it's so basically I have a transaction service that can handle any of these transaction types because the rules are so the same, if you like, for mm -hmm. adding or updating a transaction. That so they what? are literally identical, and the only thing that changes is the generic parameters. The, I don't think it would be too difficult, though, to rip all of that out and then say, hey, there's no generics here. It's just copied code, essentially. The, the rules are only the same because you don't have enough sample of clients yet. Wait till you hit, like, 5,000 clients. I think you might be right there. Yeah, I think it's a scale thing. But also the rules are largely the same because... I've been able to do my sort of architect slash BA piece and go, well, actually, what when you distill it down, these things are the same. It fundamentally, at a basic level, all I'm doing is I'm performing CRUD operations on transactions on a daily iterative process. And then what I'm doing is I'm saying, OK, where the business action warrants some additional business logic, I'm saying the nature of this business action is to just raise an event and trigger some further stuff to happen on top so for example when i receive a remittance advice line i can take that remittance advice line i can put that into the system so that's just a standard insert right so it's a transaction insert mm -hmm. but the act of doing that will update a related transaction to a state of paid so that additional piece of business logic i trigger as a separate event i don't do it as part of my insert it's a separate operation and because i've broken my business logic down in that way it's allowed it's afforded me a certain amount of flexibility but but wait 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 if the insert succeeds but the event that you send off fails do you have to revert the insert right so this is where things get interesting okay because the event <laughs> and the insert are all validated up front so i know whether or not it can succeed before i do it i then pull everything that i need to do the whole lot of this out of the database <laughs> do the whole lot in memory and then say ef save that <laughs> and ef goes no worries i can build you a hundred meg sql transaction and i do that for a transaction set or a, 
a batch of at the moment. And this is why I approached you because you I started are seeing batches. <laughs> yeah, I know. I started seeing batches get bigger and requests get longer. And, you know, gonna... I've, had, I've had individual API calls last 10 minutes and it's just gone, I've done it. <laughs> and SQL's gone, thank for that. <laughs> <laughs> Even even a dedicated Azure server rack that costs a thousand dollars per minute will tell you get out of here. Yeah, so, but it works I, somehow. I've done the miracle because what I've done is I've written my business logic such a way that um, I've analyzed what um, our clients actually do, and day to day, if you actually look at what they do, right? So let's say I receive um, in the CSV file. Let's say I receive thirty thousand lines. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, 29,900 of them are probably identical from what I received yesterday. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in terms of what I actually need to do to the database, I only need to add the other 100 or update the other 100, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So because of that, what I'm doing is I'm doing a lot of complicated questions. So I'm, I'm doing lots of get calls in that business logic to figure out what actually needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the actual SQL transaction that's built is for the other hundred lines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So because I made the I made the business logic smarter and smarter and smarter, so that I could do less and less work on the SQL Server to to basically distill it down to exactly what needs to be done. But mm -hmm. if a client sent us say ten thousand transactions every day and they were always new or always updated, I'd be screwed. But our system would just cave. Um, well, actually, it, it would. Um, I, I've recently done some stuff which is arguably an, an excellent hack, but it's a hack, none the same, um, <laughs> that allows me to not be constrained by the limits of a HTTP request, <laughs> shall we say. But, yeah, SQL Server doesn't really like it much. And I'm sitting here, like, almost every day I'm effing and blind in a SQL going, oh, pile of crap, oh, oh, oh. can only handle 100 meg transactions. I mean, come on. What kind of crappy server is this? But no. It's, I think I think you and I can actually employ this vertical cul-de-sac pattern. It will help you a lot. Yeah, from your cul-de-sac at scale thing, yeah? So, um, well, actually, while well, I've still got this on screen, um, I started looking at this. Ooh, so look at that. <laughs> beautiful, isn't it? It's yes. so elegant, right? Yes. So <laughs> it looks like it looks like a motherboard, like designing these chips on a motherboard. It's nice. Let's yes. see. Let's see what it looks like. So mm. let's just take one piece of this because it's it's just a repeated pattern, okay? Right. So can you see this okay? Yep. Excellent. So what I did was I started with brokers and I said, hey, um, at the effectively the the layer that immediately sits on top of my database, I want a thing that only deals with a single entity row. Um, so I'm either doing an update or an insert, or yep. um, and yep. brokers can do gets as well and things like that. So um, I said, okay, brilliant. So I need basic CRUD to talk to my database. Mm -hmm. So um, I've actually built this, by the way, um, or at least a, a, a piece nice. of this. Um, nice. I've built the invoice piece, and my plan was to duplicate that out after we'd had this discussion, assuming we were going down the right route. So I wanted yep. to verify first that I'm going down the right route. Yep. Um, and it might be that what we do is we talk architecture in this session, and then we move into the code next session or something. Yep. I don't know. Um, Whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, unless, well... We could be here all day, potentially, but you're not going to beat me on how long I can go. So that sounds I, like a challenge. I, I will wear friend. you down before you even before I even start getting a little sleepy, a little, you know. But let's just go. So you built basically. You're, you're joking, right? I've been at this for six years. <laughs> I don't <laughs> sleep. I've got two I, girls. I, I, I... <laughs> sleep. Yeah, you have two kids too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, um, so yeah, so I started with fundamentally, I said, look, the basic premise of any system is CRUD for every entity type. Okay. So this is where I started. So um, the, these are the headers. Um, so invoice broker deals with CRUD for my my invoice headers. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I've got all of these um these, these are the child collection brokers, effectively. So they would handle the individuals at the broker level. Mm -hmm. um, then in accordance with the standard, I said, okay, we need some foundation services to sit on top of those, okay? So they would deal with um, basically 
yeah. the basic service layer logic for an individual entity type. Um, and then what I said was, okay, what I need to do now is I need to start putting the pieces together, yeah. right? Because I yeah. need to start to get to a point where I can tip an invoice in and a whole invoice can be handled as a, a solid object because. Oh no, Paul. We lost Paul. Let's give him a second to come back for. <laughs> Give him a second there. So talking about wearing Paul out, I think I did, I did wear him out. <laughs> while while he's on the way, since we talked about you know, um, uh, we talked about temporal tables. I just I'm gonna share this, you know, just with people watching. So in Entity Framework temporal tables, all you really gotta do, you know, it's really simple. All you gotta do is just go ahead. This is Jeremy Lickness, um, uh, kind of announcement. But what you basically do when you're setting up your entity, you just say to table, and then you basically go and say, I want this to be temporal. That's all that it is. And what that does, it generates something really beautiful in the database that basically allows you, let's see, I want to show you what that looks like in the database. Let's see. Yeah, Paul is just saying Windows decided to update his system. <laughs> I promise I didn't trigger it. You know, it just happened by itself. So what what this does is that you can go and say, I want I want to pull all my temporal tables record from this date to that date. And when you put that in there, it will allow you to kind of pull data that has changed on the same record from one date to the next. It's really beautiful. I I will uh, I will create a session a special session just for this piece. This piece is super, super cool. And it's also going to help us with kind of rollback. And, you know, there's there's these ideas that I'm trying to kind of implement in terms of rollback and stuff like that. I think you're going to, you guys are going to find this uh, super exciting and super important. Uh, there's, there's also a lot of rules around temporal tables. Um, you know, you can, you can dictate few things, you know, throughout, you know, uh, your, your process so you can query that data because you're saving data now you want to query that data i want to see what this data looks like actually since we're doing it let's see if i can show you so here is here's git file right sorry this is star ruffle right so let me share my screen here so here's star ruffle service this is our social media decentralized social media platform I'm just going to revert everything in there. I was just explaining mm -hmm. something something to Mabruk and Ricky yesterday. And let's just take a look at this. So I'm going to go here, just pull from main and sync up. And let's just find there. I think the post uh, the post uh, controller is, is good, right? So you can actually post a post through post to post through your controller. So let's just see here. If I go here and say, let me just update the database just to make sure that everything is working the way it's expected. Let's just go down here. I'll show you a real life, real time um, temporal table. So update database. Let's do this. So me updating the database, just saying whatever I have in the database right now, no migration ready. Yeah, and I was trying this with, with Josh McCall you know, with the UI section of it. So it should be very straightforward. Now, 
the 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 thing here is that I'm gonna go into my brokers. Let me increase the the percentage on my screen here just so people can see what's happening. So let me go to 150 percent. Yeah, that will make things a little bit more clear. There you go. And then I'm gonna go into my storage brokers are here. And under posts, this is my posts. I'm gonna create a new a new nested partial model in here called post.references, storage broker.post.references. So here's storage. I know you can't see this storage broker.post.references.cs. This would nest right under that one. And then I'm gonna go here and say private static add post references and this will take in something called a model builder this is my model builder this model builder got it in here and then i'm going to go down here and say okay uh this guy void okay perfect and then i want to take that model builder and say entity and that entity would be the post right because that's what i'm trying to modify like this, and then I want to go and say, uh, 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 let's see, what was what was the setup for this real quick? Let me see this. You can basically just go and say uh, a two table. So this is entity two table, like this, two table. And this table would be, I think if I do the post here, I might not need the table name i don't think maybe i do, maybe i do we'll see so let's see this is an overload yeah i don't need to do it so i can go here and say post post dot is temporal just like that so now what this is going to do it's going to do something beautiful in the database because what's going to happen is that it's going to allow me to um um it's it's going to allow me to kind of keep track of this but i need to actually insert these references in here so i'm just going to go here and say add post references and here's my model builder now i need to generate a migration so i'm going to go here and say add migration and then add post temporal just like that okay so this will generate a migration here's a migration and this migration is saying okay enable temporal table for posts. So all of these things have been generated now. That's great. And it's all SQL Server. It's all related to that stuff. So it's all great. Okay. And then, Paul, I'm just showing people temporal tables while you're updating. I know Windows ruined, Windows ruined your moment. Is that what it is? So, oh, Freaking Windows, man. I mean, <laughs> you should, you should see. Have you seen this scene from uh, what's it called? Uh, Star Force or something like that? Space Force. <laughs> You know, when the guy is saying, oh, the asteroid is going to hit the planet in, in 12 <laughs> minutes. Have you seen it? Let me show yeah. you. One minute, Windows is updating. Yep, yep. Have you seen it? You saw it? Let me yeah. show you. Hold on, hold on. Let me show it to people. It's hilarious. Here it is. <laughs> so this is, I want to, it's a Chrome tab, share audio, and then there is the new tab. Okay, can you see the, can you see, can you see my uh, screen right now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see. So this is a temporal, not, not temporal, um, a Space Force Windows update. There it is. It's hilarious. Check it out. Tell, tell me if you can hear it. Can you hear it? Okay, so there it is. Let's go. There's echo on it, though. Dr. Chen, recalculate the new thruster data and relay it to Blue Oyster called immediately. Okay, roger that, doctor. Ah! <laughs> What's wrong? Seriously, you auto updating now? General, I wouldn't be able to calculate the right data for the satellite for 49 minutes. How long to live? One minute and 44 seconds. Fuck Microsoft! <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, let me just go back to this because I was showing people uh, what's happening. So this is okay, so. So I generated temporal tables, Paul, just to catch you up. All I did is just go here and said entity to table is temporal. That's all I did. And then I created a migration, right? So if I go here and say update database, that will just execute my migration. I'm going to show you this in real time. It's beautiful. It's freaking magic. Okay. So now that I know this is happening, if you look in the database, I don't know what I, what I called my database here. Did I call it 
probably called it so okay tarafu core db so let's go back here into the database and if you look at tarafu core db and if you open up the posts table do you see that post tables in here it, it starts to show something next to it it's called system versioned and if you open that one it will show you this temporal table in here now okay, if i cool. oh it's it's no that's just the beginning now watch you know i'm opening it it will show you the period period end period start so it tells you exactly the time where that record stayed in the database before it changed oh, okay nice. now now hang on there let's test it right let's test it let's go and run and insert a post in the system and then try to delete or update that post in that system and let's see what happens so i'm going to go back into my um my swagger here and i'm going to go into api posts try it out take away a lot of this garbage which i told people literally to okay so here's a post i'm going to execute should create a post for me real quick here's a post and here is wait one more validation the json object contains trailing comma that's right okay where yeah this guy i didn't like this guy so execute let's see what else we have uh 409 post with the id already exists because i tried it somewhere else so let's do one let's do nine right and let's post again okay here it is so i created a post right i have this post in the database if you go and try to update this post so i'm going to take this guy here and i'm going to go into the put section of it so this is put posts try it out this whole thing the only difference is that i'm going to take in the id of that post and i'm going to put it in here the id i'm going to put it in here I'm going to update that post. Let's see if I can update that post. I think I need, uh, yeah, date is the same as created date. You shouldn't have the exact same created date. I need the old created date that I had in here, which is all tight. Let's see where is. Uh, I wrote what I call is system managed for that. So in the data context, when I do updates, I pull the existing version and I set that value from the database. So it's not um, holding clients back, basically. Yeah, but but then you end up in a situation where if you're running data migration, you're going to have to override your existing data to over to override these rules. So it doesn't work, you know. No, 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 no. So like in my in terms of like how that would look in the standard, right? So uh -huh. in my broker, whenever I do an update on a thing that has a created date, uh -huh. I, I would just add an additional line in there that says, OK, I've got the, the DB version. I've got the new version. I will yeah. set the created date from the DB version and then push that version of the new row essentially with that created date value set to the uh -huh. database. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. So so just give me a second here. Uh... So then oh, it, it doesn't matter what the client basically sends. I mark that in my metadata so I can basically say, hey, I'm going to ignore whatever value you give me. You can give me a value if you want, but I'm going to ignore it because it's system managed. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm going to delete that record just for now. OK, if I go back into the, your temporal table in here, look what it did. If I refresh this guy, it already got a track of it, even though that record is gone because it says this record ended the period end in here the moment you deleted it it's really sweet paul it's really really sweet you can even go back and say i'm gonna take that id in here and i'm gonna go back and create a record with the exact same id again right a record with the exact same id again so I can basically, for whatever reason, you want to go here and say, here is my here is my record. I'm going to just refresh this real quick. And I'm going to go here and say, here's my API post. Try it out. Take away this garbage. You know, Ricky, if you're watching this, please do a JSON ignore on this one. But here's, here's your ID. And I'm creating that record. That's not the same, is it? Execute. 
Okay, so if I go back here, look at this. Come on. Here is your record. Is this the same ID that I had? So now this guy has a new... No, this is the same 1855. Okay, let me take that record in here and let me go back here. Let's see. Back here. And let me just do this real quick. I'm going to go into my uh, put posts and try it out and take away all of this. Right. How do I? I just want to show you the magic that this thing does. Give me a second, Paul. I, I, this is really important. Um, so this is Paul's try it out. Uh, take away this this garbage. This is supposed to be on JSON ignore. And let's just call this 11. Right? So this is my 11 number. I'm going to copy that here. I'm going to shoot that out. OK, I have this in here. Now, if I go into the put area and say try this out, I just need Let's go here. I just need this updated date in here. But I can keep my created date in here. And this is 11. I'm just going to change this a little bit. Let's see if I can get this through. OK, so this got updated, right? So I created a record, and I updated that record. Check this out. If I go down here. And I refresh this guy, look what happens. So you have a record in here. No, that's a new record. That's that's the one that I just created. Wait a second. Come on. Hold on. Let's go back here. I want to update that record now. So let's let's update it again. Hold on. So if I go here and say is a new record, I think I'm out of date now. Okay. Sure. Do this. This is 11. That's my created date. Let's get a new one. Here's put. Try it out. Take this out. And then I want this created date to be here. And I want this to be 11. And here's my new string. And if I do this, execute. Okay, this is this guy is done. If I go back into the database itself and I refresh this, check this out. Look, so so there is the most recent value that's existing in the table itself, and then the previous value goes into your temporal table. Does that not um, explode out the size of your database? Because, like in my case, for example, I keep one copy of every transaction. But if I receive that transaction 60 times, my database is going to be 60 times bigger. Because that's a normal pattern for, like, sort of client that I have. If nothing is changing in that transaction, it won't add a new record. So if nothing is changing, I don't actually go to the database at all. No, no, no. If you send 50 transactions with the exact same values, it will only give you one temporal table record. So, yeah, so this is where there's going to be, presumably to take advantage of this properly, I'd have to change my business logic. So every day I would receive the transaction and every day I would always issue an update right, to the database. And the database would go, actually, nothing's really changed. You, you, don't, you don't have... You, you could do it. So if you allow your audit fields to change based on the date and time, it will consider that to be a change. Do you know these created data? So what, data? Yeah, no, no. What I'm getting at is if, if, I've, if I've got a row in the database and I've got the exact same row essentially in memory, and then I say, hey, update, does that show as a temporal entry? No. Right. Unless so at the, the moment, it's an updated date change. Yeah, so at the moment, what I do is I put an audit entry in the attached audit items to say, hey, an update was issued, even in that situation. 
you could still have a state, but you wouldn't have the previous values if you update the record. Like if your record says a thousand dollars, and the incoming record to update that record says ninety nine dollars, where does this one thousand dollar go? It disappears, right? Yeah. So at the at the moment, I would lose the old version of the transaction. But in that That's... state, what I'm mm -hmm. saying is um, the the transaction has actually changed. And the only thing that supplier cares about anyway is the current version of the transaction. However, Unless in, this, in this debugging state where you're mm -hmm. trying to fix an issue with it, having mm -hmm. the previous version would actually be a great help. <laughs> so there's a bit of, yeah, there, there's some really weird edge cases, but I, yeah, I can see how this would be useful. Unless you want to give your supplier the entire uh, audit history of the changes that happened to that transaction so they can they do the debugging from their side and issue a revert or a split out of a particular transaction. Yeah, that sounds like really cool UI functionality, actually, to be able to say, hey, actually, this, this thing here was not meant to be that transaction. Here's a new reference. Make a new transaction from this data, from the temporal table. Anyway, kind of cool. going back to you, sir. So you yes. So where, where I got to was, so we have an individual service for each um, entity type, which are our foundation services. And then I started um, using your rule of maximum three dependencies. Okay. Yep. I paired them up and I said, okay, I've got an invoice processing service. You can't, you can't do that. This should be an orchestration service. Processing service don't combine multiple entities. Orchestration services do. Right. So then what I'm doing is I'm combining my processing services in the orchestration service. And this is how I'm managing from the orchestration service level, six different entity types. In one hit. What you should do, you should have every uh, Azure colored sky. Co what do you call this color in the middle? Azure? No. Uh, this one? Yeah. The, the sky blue? Yeah. Each one of those just change processing to orchestration and the... Uh, dark blue one call it coordination you're done ah okay so i i had these round round the other way so um yeah okay so this is a coordination coordination service. which is a, an orchestration of orchestrations right so these become then orchestration services yep that's now, fair enough that's just um that's just naming so i can change that in my code easily enough yeah, absolutely. Because processing basically means that you're doing a higher order business logic on the same entity, like upsert. Upsert mm -hmm. is higher order, right? It's not primitive operation, but you're also not orchestrating. You know, in a way, processing services orchestrate between primitive capabilities that are provided for the same entities by the same foundation service. I hope so that you would say sense. in the foundation service, you'd have basic CRUD. And in yeah. a process, processing service, you'd have like an upsert. Yeah. And then or, in or your verify orchestration exists. service. Yeah, or verify exists. Or you do things like the the things that combine or uh, orchestrate two or more primitive operations from the foundation service layer. Crap. So what that means is I actually need processing services. And that's because, okay. You, you could have an entirely new line of processing services on top of that. Yeah. So what this basically means is in here, in this you need area processing here, services. Yes. yeah, there's going to be another tier of them because some of the business operations that I'm doing at the moment where I've, I will, we'll have a look at some of my, you're doing probably. upsert. I know what you're doing. You're doing upsert. You're going to need, so copy that green line and just put another line in front of it. Call it, call it processing services. Let's do that now then, shall we? Yeah. You're getting good at get, draw IO. Yeah, yeah, it's good, isn't it? That's how you communicate with people, the most efficient way. Otherwise, there is no way for me to understand whatever language you're speaking. <laughs> I, I've, I really like draw IO, actually, and it's, it's, it's one cool, of these things. It's cool, right? It, yeah, it, it's such a simple tool, and it just makes it just works, man. Things. It just works. You know, there is. You should see. Like I've used previous, you know, software. It's just really garbage. It's very hard, you know. And it just try. It's trying to do smart things for you. And I don't want it to do smart things for me, right? I just want it to do something normal, right? So anyway, yeah, let's do that. And then you basically just connect these to your orchestration services. Oh yeah, that's right. You need to call it processing. That's right.
There you go. Yep, almost there. And then we hook these up. And then you just hook them up. That's it. Now, you could do that, Paul, or you could do vertical cul-de-sac. We'll talk about that in a second. It depends on how so, idempotent your process is, brother. Yeah, so my thinking is that um, thinking about the standard and, and your feedback of where I need to put different bits of logic, I'm going to need the the vertical scale stuff from your um, you know, cul-de-sac at scale video, mm -hmm. but I'm going to need this kind of structure. So essentially what's going to happen is I'm going to have all of this is responsible for handling anything that can happen essentially to an invoice, right? Let me ask you this. Is, is there someone waiting on the other side? um like like in the in front of this invoice coordination service is there a human being waiting for an answer um i'll ask you one no, more question no, then... normally no okay because no, it's this is triggered by workflow right so yep. the files been sent and it's yep. just a background they dump process. The, perfect they dump the files and then the files get processed right okay yeah. now hold hold on with me for a second this second question is really important because based on that question, we can determine whether cul-de-sac vertical at scale works for you or not, okay? Because this pattern is not exactly obsolete. It just works in different cases and it simplifies the business and design process. A little bit of work, but it gets you where you wanna go. So here's the other question. The other question is, if you insert, I'm assuming you insert the voice invoice and then you, in, you insert the invoice line line. And yeah, then after so that, it, it works, it works vertically. Yeah. So start yeah. from the top. Yeah. Um, so I can't insert any of the child items until the header is in. Yeah. So you inserted the header. And then I work my way down the chain. Okay. So let me ask. So if one of them fails, what should you do? They can't fail. They can't. So this is why I have this stack of services working. The, so th this is the cool thing, right? My business logic is set up that it, it upfront determines whether or not the operation is going to happen. But, but, it, but there is no way for you to tell because your database could break at the very end. True. Yeah. So this is why my business logic is written the way that it is at the moment. Imagine this entire stack, right, is all implemented in what I call the invoice service. And it goes, right, I'm going to get the data in all the right state in memory. And then I'm going to say, SQL, process this. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. what happens at the moment. And okay. for that reason, yeah. So okay. here's another one for it. Even if you're doing it this way, if you have an interruption midway while your query is executing, you're going to insert some data and some data won't go through. What do you do then? You got half a transaction in the database. It's not valid. Okay. So here's... Yeah. Here's the right way to do it. <laughs> Here's a right way to do it. Okay. Well, the, the, we obviously know that the correct answer here is, is unit of work and ensuring that, you know, everything does happen as a unit. So my question to you, obviously, in the background, which has led to this meeting, has been around how do we, at scale, implement the cul-de-sac pattern but in such a way that I can break down the workload, but we can still have this concept of a unit of work wrapped around these queued events that are going to happen for the future rows. So right. putting this into context, if I insert the invoice header into the database mm -hmm. and then say, okay, I'm going to separately queue up inserting all of the lines on, mm -hmm. a, on a service bus queue, I want to ensure that all of those lines either go in or we roll back the whole thing. Yes. So th these are the things that really matter. And this is why historically I've not broken the problem down in this manner because I've not really known how to architecturally solve that problem. And this okay. is where your know-how comes in. <laughs> yes. So, so here's the deal. If you break it in this manner here, this works right i will create a special session because this is going to take a while like introducing rollbacks to the world and i'm so happy that this happens like this conversation is happening because you don't understand 
these discussions is what makes me make YouTube videos. Like when you see, like I didn't talk about cul-de-sac vertical or a scale out of the blue. Hmm. More and more and more cases started coming in and people were starting. There's a guy that came to me. He said, what's beyond management service? Because I need more. I said, <laughs> well, no, you're doing something wrong. Yeah. You're not supposed to go that far. And then well, I, I hit orchestration services um, and then started, you know, well, like in this case, right, you've got a coordination service in here. Yeah, that's and that's, you went, hey, if you're going beyond orchestration services, it's probably too complicated. But this, hey, this here is, we are. This is what I'm saying. Like at some point in time, you kind of have to combine all of these because I'm assuming both. Correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, the invoice every transaction has one of these four types, right? It can't have more, right? Yeah. So imagine I've got everything that we see here mm -hmm. for invoices. Okay. Uh -huh. I've got everything that we see here for credit notes. I've got everything that we see here for remittance advices and mm -hmm. everything that we see here for offers. And the act of doing something like, hang on, Lou. The, the act of doing something like inserting a remittance advice line will mm -hmm. update the state of an invoice header. Right. So I need to be able to do things like interact these different transaction types with one another. And because there's all this business logic bolted between them and it's a mm -hmm. side effect of one thing being inserted updates the state of another thing. There's this complex interaction between my entities that historically I've had to do because that there's not been a simpler way to um, define the architecture, essentially. Right. Um, but now what if you're talking about breaking these things down so they're a lot more modular, then we've yeah. got to say, okay, in the event that we do that, we also need to make sure that the, the, the side effect events that happen as a result of, say, a simple insert mm -hmm. actually do happen as part of that unit of work. And if they don't, I need to be able to capture that information, store it somewhere, fix whatever the problem is, and yeah. then push it back into the system again. So things like, um, so one of my more recent problems whilst experimenting with this in the background, obviously I've had a bit of a play, is that mm -hmm. I've noticed that Service Bus doesn't give me much visibility of what's in a queue. Of it just says, not. hey, there's this number of messages here. Yeah, right? of course. You could do peak though. Right, but if I've got a transaction that I have a question about, and it's it won't partially, give you anything. Nope. It, it, yeah, exactly. It, it's been partially black processed. Box. Yep, it's a black box that's telling you. <coughs> this is yes. So we need why, to find. Mm -hmm, go on. Mm -hmm. This is why I talked about the lake queue. The lake queue is basically your local centralized queue that you can hook it up to service bus, but it's doing mm -hmm. something more. It's telling you here is a local database of all the queues, the messages that are waiting in the queue. It's beautiful. You're going to love it. So here's the interesting thing, right? When mm. we first started talking about this, I built this. I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, do you remember this? Yeah. And I, I posted this in the Discord, and you were like, yeah. it's so elegant. It's so yeah. practical. Um, and we, we were talking about event services that would yeah. sit alongside our regular services. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they would talk to queues, yep. right? But then I got to thinking, well, maybe the smarter way here is to follow your dependency graphing yep. in such a way that we do the branching in a more sort of structural fashion. So if we yep. took, say, just invoice headers, for example, right, mm -hmm. as a problem, mm -hmm. the basic stack of dealing with invoice headers is a processing service, an invoice service, and an invoice broker that deals with the database. Mm -hmm. Would I be allowed to have a queue broker? Yeah, three three dependencies is your maximum. Mm -hmm. That sits here, and yep. obviously, then there would be this two way communication nope. between the queue. You you have and... to build. Nope, nope, nope. You have to build an orchestration service there. I have to. You so have I can't to. just have an invoice service sit on top of two brokers. You're not doing single responsibility anymore. You own ah, two resources but... now. The invoice, so the invoice service in this case, right, is responsible for doing simple CRUD operations. Would you agree? Right, on one resource. On one resource. Okay. So, what do you consider to be a resource here? An external dependency or an entity type? Both. The database is a resource and the queue is a resource. Ah, okay. So, this to me, 
I felt like this was the cleanest way to do this without having service explosion. But if you're not accepting that, then we're in this situation where, okay, I have this. You have to build all the way up and put an orchestration service there. Now I've got to do this. Yeah. yeah. So now I've got these event services in as well. But yeah. then that causes another problem. What? Be because I've already got three dependencies on this invoice orchestration service. You need to split that last one and put it in its own thing. And I need a fourth one. Yeah. So if I grab this. and oh. Yep. Split that last one and have it be do its own thing. So this is my invoice line event queue broker. broker. Yeah, sure. Queue broker, yes. Mm -hmm. And then my invoice line event, event services. An event processing. It's like event processing service. And now we have two orchestration services sitting in between. No. Two orchestration services. Yeah, of course. Ah, oh, okay. So ah, so would you put the um so the sorry, invoice on, processing and it's Invoice processing and invoice event is completely separate now from your invoice line. It doesn't know anything about it. It just knows that I insert the header and something will happen after that, no matter what the thing is. So Right. So what you're doing is you're saying, okay, let me pull this out of the way a minute. My, my stuff that deals with the database sits mm -hmm. under an orchestration service. Mm -hmm. And my stuff that deals with my queues. There you go. That works. Sits under a separate orchestration service. You you could you could also you could also do something really smart about this. You could you could keep the event processing the invoice processing event service on its own and combine downwards as you go. You could also do that. So I can have. You could have invoice processing an invoice line processing an invoice processing event. In under the same orchestration service. So in, invoice processing and invoice line processing are under and um, so you would put invoice processing and invoice event processing. Yes, under the same orchestration service. Under the same. Oh, okay. So you would link them the mm -hmm. other way. Like, yeah. Uh, so if I grab this. So every entity has a subscriber pipeline and a publisher pipeline or just a publisher pipeline. Right. <laughs> You're like, oh my God, I'm going to code for days. <laughs> <laughs> well, given this pattern, mm -hmm. um, it's... It's one of these things where I started looking at it, and the reason why I had um... now you can feed off of that one, like pull, pull a, pull a, pull a, pull, pull a, a, a an arrow from invoice event processing service and hook it up from there to your invoice event orchestration service or whatever you want to call it. Call it invoice, invoice line in here. So, yeah, take 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 that arrow from here and move it over to the next orchestration service. Yep. In yep. Here? Yep. Okay. And so now, we're allowing this to talk to this. No. You, you, yeah, it's it's not talking to it. It's subs. It's pub. It's your invoice. Your invoice line orchestration service will subscribe through it. But this doesn't have. A coordination service sitting on top of it. It's nope, purely not an anymore. event handler. Right. Yep. If, if you do it this way, you lose your coordination service forever. You don't need uh, it anymore. Well, I still need the coordination service, right? Because I'm going to receive an entire transaction. And I need to break that down and give it to my individual. Mm. What, you could, what you could do. Oh, I love this. Can I take your screen? Can yeah, take your screen? sure. Okay. Check this out. Let me blow your mind a little bit. So let me ask you something. Does you said the invoice? Um, let me fix my screen because I, I increase the I increase the resolution there for for the code. But now since we're just designing, I don't think it matters. There you go. There it is. So listen to me, my friend. Did you say that the invoice 
has the header has to be inserted before any other entity can be inserted? Yeah, because the others have foreign keys that need to refer to the primary key of the invoice, right? Okay, so now hear me out. <clears throat> this is this is the one that you're looking for then. Uh, assume that when I put a block like this, this block will represent brokers, services, and processing services, okay? Just for the quick of, of expression. I'll do it with you in a second, okay. right? Okay. So let's say this is your invoice service. Okay, and your request, your request is coming through some orchestration service, invoice orchestration service. Are we clear? We're good, right? Yeah. Now, once this guy is inserted, assume that this guy is the guy that receives the transaction from the outside world. So that guy was sending a complete transaction, right? And it's yeah. going to receive what? The header back? Yeah. And this transaction has the invoice, invoice line. And what are the other three things that you have? Uh, so we've got lines, references, companies. Uh, we don't need to return the audit trail. Um, so, but so they're all there is within... an audit trail there. And yeah, there's they're... buckets, but we can talk about buckets separately. They're all within an invoice transaction, right? One big invoice transaction, right? Yeah. So what's going to be sent to the endpoint is the whole transaction. And that's the only way we can confirm whether or not it's valid at the orchestration level Perfect. or potentially now at the coordination level. <laughs> Perfect. Now hear me out. Okay. What we're going to do here is that we're going to go persist this guy in, in the database. That's your invoice storage broker. Yeah. I'm actually experimenting on this cul-de-sac at scale with you. So let's see if it works for your case. Okay. Once that guy is persisted, you can take that entire model and ship it through an event. Let's call this in event invoice, event service. And this is your invoice event broker or queue broker, whatever you want to call it, right? Q broker. Now watch this. This guy here is the guy that every other one of these pieces that you talked about is subscribed to. Okay. Because we're living on this screen in the 2D space, it's very hard to make you see it. But let me just try to my best here. So assume that you have in here thing called invoice line right that's the next thing right invoice line yep and what's after invoice line invoice reference uh, right invoice reference yeah okay these guys in here will subscribe to this and it will go and say, give me that event and let me go persist these two values in here. So far, so good, right? So, yeah, my difficulty has not been understanding that. It's been figuring out how logically those pieces actually work in code. So if you uh, think about uh, what the first service has done, it's, in, it's inserted the header into the database. And it said, OK, right. I'm going to raise an event to say now I'm done. Yes. Yeah. OK. So what was put into that queue broker's queue because the a single thing. the whole the whole transaction there. yes okay so what if the whole transaction is bigger than 256 kilobytes it doesn't matter it does to as your service bus as your service bus premium gives you up to one megabyte okay what if a single transaction is bigger than a megabyte then you use blob storage with Azure Service Bus. We put files in this thing. Let me show you. It's okay. okay. I, I, if I haven't gone through this, I wouldn't be able to answer it. Let me show you. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, there, there was a lot of inferred stuff in there that I yeah. hadn't clicked was possible because I, I looked at the basic definition of what you're supposed to use 
service bus queues for and my understanding was simple small units of message essentially I, ideally you would do that but you can a actually post yeah, yeah. You know, so, if you... so my original question then came back to crap i've got a thing that i want to put on a queue that's bigger than a twitter post how do i do then it you, then you use a blob <laughs> storage right you know, okay do you know what people do the message contains just the reference to that blob storage uh okay See? so stick the thing stick the thing in blob storage yeah and send and... the message with the reference right that's some enterprise craziness for you <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's a proper way to do it though i promise but you now we're in this position where our dependency graph is starting to sprawl no and actually, that worries me I, actually i think in your case you don't need service bus at all oh really are you planning to create multiple microservices or are you planning to stay within the same monolith uh elaborate are you planning to have all this code in one big service api yeah i mean it, it's um then you didn't need service bus service yeah, buses okay. for multiple microservices talking to each other so, yeah so the, the problem that i've hit is memory limitations if when i start pushing transaction sets to my api they can get quite big because even though the raw csv data is like let's say i've got 10 megs worth of csv Mm -hmm. When you translate that into entities, you end up with 100, 150 megs, 200 megs worth of entities. And then the data that's required to validate that, so the GET requests that I do on the database, might be another gigabyte. Um, and then that ends up then exploding over time when you start performing more and more business logic. And then eventually it just gets to the point where it's like, can't make a string to put on a queue. <laughs> if, if, if you dispose properly... You won't need to worry about that, especially if you embody this unit of work mindset. Like, look how we build our storage brokers. We do a using statement and we wrap up as soon as the transaction is done. Everything is gone. Your garbage collection is coming in and saying, okay, I can't even find it anymore. It's gone, right? That's the whole point so, of scoping, right? Yeah, so the problem that I've hit is probably a, a fairly common problem for like senior devs, which is mm -hmm. I get in principle what I'm supposed to do. Um, and then the details. But then, yeah, the, the act of doing it, there's some silly little detail that's missed that I'm all here. I'm seeing in my application is that I'm, I don't know, let's say I'm getting an out-of-memory exception. And I'm like, why? I did exactly what, like, Hassan said to do, and I ran out of memory. Why did I run out of memory? And then, <laughs> of course, you're sitting there going, wow, you missed this obvious little small thing. And I'm like, really? <laughs> That's why we're sitting here right now. I told you I'm going to I'm going to give you 4 hours and we're going to design this together. Here we are. Right? Nice. So here's what I'm going to do. So do you see this? This is hard to express in the 2D space. So I hope you can wrap your mind about what I'm going to do right now. Okay? So this same thing, do you see this same model? That's it's the same. I'm going to make it in blue. Mm -hmm. to tell you that it's the same and I'm going to make this in purple to tell you that this is a different line. I'm going to go here and do that exact same thing here. The only difference here is, is that instead of invoice line and invoice reference, it's going to be companies and buckets. And that's a different one, Paul. But it's the same guy here. So that basically means that this guy is also subscribed to the, that exact same event. I just can't explain it to you in the 3D space. Like, like these two so, orchestras. These so two. You're, you're passing them down a, down the chain essentially. So you what the way you're suggesting here? If I if I'm understanding the visualization right here, mm -hmm. if you take the stuff on the right and put it mm -hmm. below the stuff on the left, you could then draw a line between the bottom uh leftmost uh so the invoice reference service on the bottom there mm -hmm. the purple one mm -hmm. you could draw a line between that and the orchestration service on the right this one or this one uh the top one yes yes Th so I... your this is your at scale chaining things down the line essentially L let me ask vertically <laughs> L let me let me ask you this is there any dependency between an invoice line and an invoice reference 
and a company and a bucket. No. That's that's what I'm saying. So what I'm saying to you here is that the main let me try it this way. Maybe this will make it clearer. If I take this out in here and I take this out in here just for a second, what's basically happening is that both of these stacks in here from the back, from the back of your service, they're subscribed to the same event, which is this guy. Ah, uh, okay. So, so you're, both you're, of these... drawing, you're drawing the line from the invoice event service to the invoice orchestration service in purple there, right? To this? Yeah. And, and to this. And then, yeah, to that one, yeah. Not sequentially, though. Like, this guy won't wait on this guy to finish. Yeah, so they would happen in parallel. So if you move that bottom blue block yep. over to the left a bit more, you'll be able to see the line properly. Wh which one? Grab this that one? bottom bottom set of the stack. Yep. Grab, yeah, that's it. Move it to the left a bit more so the line goes out. Like this, yes. That's it. Yeah. That, that's yeah, the like 3D that. space. Yes. That's just, yeah. So what, what we're doing is we're basically having a single queue that we're putting the whole transaction into and everything then takes that transaction out and pulls out its piece of it. Okay, so this is good because this is what I wrote code for, <laughs> believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and I've gotten to the point where, um, so I've followed your kind of methodology and I've I've got unit tests for all of the foundation services, essentially, for just for one transaction type. So we're just talking about invoices at the moment. Mm. Um, with the next level up being the, the processing and then the orchestration services. And those were the pieces that I wasn't quite sure how it would all fit together. Um, the other thing that I'm kind of not quite sure about is the, the queues. So if the queue is going to live in memory, again, am I going to hit a a problem with running out of memory or should i be persisting my queue messages somewhere so should i for example i could drop them to my document management system as just a blob or as your blob storage or something like that it doesn't matter where but okay as individual messages does that make sense yes so okay so your queue messages are already in your memory the moment you receive them do we have an agreement on that Ah, uh, so from that point of view, you're saying just, it's just no additional around. cost, right? Yeah, it's you already paid that cost. You don't you don't have an option. It will always be there mm -hmm. until you wrap up. Yeah, because once it's handing over that reference, it's not its problem anymore. It doesn't copy it. That's yeah. advanced engineering for you. So what? So you're differentiating now between service bus queues and local in-memory queues. This, this is kind of nice, actually, because this will actually simplify the architecture. That if, I've... If, I, if I'm done with that lake queue, you wouldn't even have to think about it because you can hook it up to service bus or to local queue in memory or in database. You'll see. It's going to blow your freaking mind. Yeah, I'd be interested to see an implementation of the in-memory queue then and how yep. you potentially see that working. Yeah. <clears throat> will be, I think it, it will I, be referential like the value it's handing over to you hmm. once you call complete on the queue it will make it vanish nice when does it call compute com complete when it finishes up publishing it to all the subscribe server I'll sh it's gonna freaking blow your mind i don't even know where i got that from have you ever, <laughs> have you ever came up with an idea and you watched you wash or read what you did or saw the code that you did. When I did that cul-de-sac, the next day I watched the video again. I said, that's someone else. That's not me. I don't know where that came from. I swear to God, Paul. It is funny how, like, um, they, they call it imposter syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. Where, like, you get to a point in your career where you do know it all, but you just you look at what you've done and you've gone, where did I get that? Yeah, like somebody else did that. Surely, I'll I'll tell you that. I much. am not I'm, up to that. <laughs> I'll t I'll tell you that much. The reason why the standard keeps evolving so much is that is that I'm a con on a continuous 
quest to beat my own score. I don't look at anybody else. This is why my stuff is unique. Like, you won't find that crap anywhere else, truly. And this is why I came to you, because I saw some potential in it, and I was like, great, okay, let's give them a real world. Let's try it. Give it a whirl. <laughs> See how it handles. And, you know, I, I'm quite fortunate, because I'm kind of like the, you know, I'm, I'm the principal architect and, and, and lead dev on all You of get this. to make that decision. That's true. And, yeah, it gives me the opportunity to sort of play around with these things and you know if if things are not going to fit i'll yep. tell you you know i'll say look in the real world this doesn't work Hassan. Yep. like solve this problem for yep. me <laughs> I, I i remember as soon as you came back to me and said hassan i don't know if your standard works i said that's a good friend you know nice. what the problem is <laughs> so i work with a lot of like junior entry level sometimes sometimes senior engineers right and they get to see the standard and they form their ideas around that. And when they're dropped in a place where it's not necessarily standard compliant, they just get super depressed because they don't know. Their main problem is that they don't know how to go advocate, you know, but also they don't have the experience. Like you said, that you're a principal engineer level. What happens is that you get to say, like, it's been a very long time since someone told me actually what to do at work. I just go into a team. And I look at the team situation and say, hey, guys, I'm working on this now. I'll be like, oh, okay, then. Oh, that's nice. I'd love to be in that position. Yep. I, I suppose you get the freedom because you're employed for your expertise, right? Yep. And so they, they just trust that you know what to do. So they I stick you in there and they say, sort it out. Don't care I, how you do it. I literally <laughs> got hired at Microsoft because of my YouTube channel. Someone saw the stuff that I put. I put something out there about, uh, uh, I think back in time, I said, you know how you have dependencies and purposes and exposure. And I said, the future of technology is going to be big data, big data, artificial intelligence and mixed reality. And someone saw that without mentioning any names. Somebody saw that. And they were like, I want this guy to work with us. And they interviewed me to death for like five meetings. Each one of them is an hour and a half. And I was like, listen, guys, I don't know if you're going after the right guy. We're like, are you the guy in this channel? I was like, yeah. He said, we want you to be here. Hmm. That's, that's been one of the big things that's like held me back from like even considering applying for companies as big as Microsoft is that the, the process is so rigorous and like in a kind of like in fact exam situation i'm one of these people that just doesn't test well um, I'd you know like, if... like when we do the o day neo stuff and you put me on the spot yeah. i look like a complete idiot i have no idea what i'm doing right <laughs> and then i like as soon as the stream ends i'm like oh i've got this <laughs> and the only difference is like i'm not on air so, someone, and I'm sitting here like, what the hell is wrong with me? <laughs> some, someone that's very near and dear to my heart, you know, um, she reached out to me and she said, you have to understand you're out there. You're writing code in front of people all the time. You've been training yourself to do that for years and years. My YouTube channel is 11 years old. So she said, you can't expect that you pull some engineer out of the blue who is used to code in the dark <laughs> and they already know they 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 100% think they're fraud even though they're 100% wrong and put them on spot and joke about their code you have to be careful Hassan and i was like ah oh, don't worry about it it's fun until <laughs> i was until i was talking to I don't know if it was Joe or someone else. He's like, I don't know. I just froze. I was talking to someone that I have so much respect for. He, he's also from England, uh, Paul. And I said to him, let's jump on a YouTube uh, video and do it. And he said to me, I'm going to look like a turtle. I'm just going to just go into my shell like this. And I'm like, okay, I, I understand. She, she kept coming back to me every time I put that. She said, see what you did? You're, you're scaring them away. I'm like, no, I'm not scaring them away. She said, you got to understand. But anyway, I understand that pattern. But I have to also tell you something. You have no idea. Do you know what I love more than software? People. <laughs> like, see. I am originally, like, if you ask my friend Josh McCall, he'll tell you this. He'll tell you Hassan is a people guy that happens to like software. But anyway, let's just go that's, back. That's rare because, like, 
from the people that I've met in the industry, my understanding is most people that work in IT got into mm-hmm. IT because they find because it they don't easier. Like people. It's more they find it easier to communicate with a machine than they yep. do with a human because you yep. know a machine will just give it you a straight oh okay it will massively yep. exaggerate this is an illegal operation yeah this is a fatal error they but you know <laughs> yeah the, the fix is normally relatively straightforward whereas with yep. human problems it's emotional and yeah you know humans particularly programmers are just like yeah uh, it's too much complication yep. I, I prefer like logical absolutes yeah an expression. <laughs> that, that's that's why there's a job called program management. It's just people yeah. that translate nerd to human. <laughs> no, yeah. You know, you know. I am like. Here's the thing. In every team, I play both. Like, I go yeah. be a manager and a program manager, and I write code. It's a problem. This is a problem, especially in big corporate, right? Because people will be like, you know, where's the space for other people to grow? This is where you have to actually lower your output. And I take my output out on YouTube. I'll be like, all right, I'll be a manager. I'll be an engineer. I'll be this or that. And I'll let someone else kind of do whatever they want. But I keep kind of inspire them with ideas and stuff. But anyway, Hmm. is this clear to you? Because if you implement this, you can do this today, even without the lay queue and try yeah, it i think i can actually i think i can see the the pieces and i already have kind of most of the pieces so i'd have to just rework some of the pieces that i've already written um the only thing that i kind of don't have is that key piece the queue yes um so i just need to figure out like what is the implementation for that if it's not a service bus queue if it's an in-memory thing what does Dude. that look like I wrote the video. I did the video for you. Just see how I implemented it in the cul-de-sac at scale. That's it. That's all that you have to do. Yeah. So you talked about in principle that there is a queue. Great. Okay. Um, I'm writing a new class um, that is, you know, a queue class. In your video, you used a service bus queue. And we've already explained, you know, I've already said to you that my message is not going to. I'm sure you did. I'm sure you used service I, bus queue. Dude, no. You 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 missed the most important part. Did I? You 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 really did. I'll I'll show you. I'm not I'm not I'm not missing around, I'll tell you here. Uh, you missed the you might have missed the most important part in that video. The that's event. probably why I had so many questions then. I must have just like skipped over it. That's annoying. No. I'm normally pretty good with your stuff. I'm always watching it. So you, you, you didn't miss it because you put it in your schedule in your. Uh, but but I want to actually press on it because that's actually what matters. Do you see this guy that I created here? This event broker, that's your queue. Um, that's your in memory queue. You're sending a message. You're publishing a message, and you're finding the registered event handlers to execute. That's it. That's all you have to do. Oh, so you didn't actually implement no as it's, such a queue behind the broker. The, it, the broker is just... It just so happens that this cul-de-sac had a queue with service bus in it to trigger the whole event. You didn't watch nothing. <laughs> Were you watching me on mute? <laughs> Wait. What so do you think? The, the trigger think is still is? service bus, right? Yeah, but it can be a controller. It doesn't matter. Like the, in the in the cul-de-sac at scale, this doesn't matter. That queue doesn't matter. This one is the one that matters. And then my next Pretty step good. is to replace this with a lake queue where you can actually use a service bus or in memory or in database. Where, what happened oh, to you? Oh, so... so hang on you would stick say like i don't know a guid on the queue for lack of a better and then when the guid comes back off the queue you'd have like a list in memory of all the stuff that was the actual transactions and then yeah. you say hey from that list get me the one where the guid matches the id or something and then yeah. stuff that to the event handler yeah that's basically what you're suggesting here yeah that was the piece that i missed yeah that that was the whole point of the video. Yeah. God damn it, Paul. Yeah, so what I did was I went and implemented it, didn't I? And I went, great, take my invoice, stick it on the queue. Service bus went... Pfft. Nope. That's that thing's it. bigger than 250K. And I went, now what do I do? Okay, can I ask, maybe I need a queue for each... Can I ask you something? 
and I, and I shouldn't be sp sp saying this as an employee at Microsoft, but, but I'll say it anyway. Why on God's green earth would you go pay for an Azure service bus to read data that's coming from the exact same source that you're publishing from? Are you kidding me right now? <laughs> You really want to give us money. Well, thank you. I, I've been thinking about buying a Lamborghini for a while. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're not wrong. And I and I actually had the same question. I was like, this is just bonkers, why, right? Why like, would how you, is this helping? <laughs> why would you pay unless you have microservices? See, a part yeah. of my pledge as well is that, see, I have some clients that would come in you know, all the time and they say, hey, Hassan, you have experience with Blazor. Would you be willing to invest? you know, in educating our clients about Blazor, right? And I go and sit down and I talk to them about Blazor and OData and all that. I, I pull Sam with me all the time. Like whatever you see Sam and I are doing in these YouTube videos, inside Microsoft, we go talk to clients all the time, all the time. Big clients from all over the world talking about how we can uh, adapt OData. But the part that I wanted to tell you about is that unless you have two microservices, living in completely different servers and they need to send messages to each other that's your only excuse of having azure service bus so but if the data physical transmission of data between yes. applications between processes yes but if the data that you're originating in the queue you're gonna read it to the exact same source where the data came from that's that's dumb <laughs> Why would you do yeah. that so you don't need service bus at all right you don't in your case if you're in building it in a monolithic application you don't need service bus so how do i build something that behaves exactly like a service bus client but doesn't use service bus that's this guy okay so there's there's a piece of the implementation there that i'm not clear on i or i can't see my dude this publish so, is me putting that student message on the queue okay so you're calling and I'm going and saying, whoever registered, let it read that message. That that will happen. There's there's no queue behind that, right? Because if you've got there a handler, it's just it, in memory. You're taking that object, and you're saying putting it in memory. The memory now becomes the queue. Sorry, what I'm getting at is, let, let's say I've got. I've got an event and I can subscribe to that event, right? Yes. And I can also um, I can also say raise the event. Okay. Yes. So let's say I've got a set of data and I say, okay, in parallel, process my set of data. Yes. Okay. When I do that, in parallel, I'm going to raise events. And right. in parallel, I'm going to handle those events. So that's yes. not a queue. That's a queue. In a way, it's a queue. You it's could call it. You could call what's it. What's going to happen if I do call, that? Right? Could be an event bus in a way as well. Right, but what's going to happen if I do that? Okay, mm -hmm. the, is essentially I'm going to take, say, my let's say I've got a hundred transactions. Right. And for each one, the handler is going to fire immediately. Okay. I'm going to create a hundred instances of all my stack. I'm going to run out of memory. Then it's going to try and process. That's why we need the lake queue to manage the available instances. But that is essentially what a queue is. You put a message there, and whoever is subscribed to that message will raise that event. Okay. What's the so difference? As long as, as long as when, um, so in my invoice coordination service, at the moment, uh, like I said, what I'm doing is I'm tipping in a whole transaction set, right? So right. imagine I've got a collection of invoices. Yeah. So for each one, if I iterate over them with standard um, standard link, not parallel, mm -hmm. or just a for each loop, right? Mm -hmm. Then they're they're processed um, essentially in a queue like fashion in that scenario, right? Yep. Because I'm yeah. So what's going to happen is the invoice header inserts can happen fairly quick. Yes. But the child collections are going to take time. Doesn't matter. You're fanning out. You're sending a fan. You're you're. You know what you can do? You can break that also into events and go and say, build a let it fan out, build a bunch of instances and let it process each line on its own. Yeah. 
yeah, that's what I've um, that's what I've built with with this essentially um, is that I've I've effectively broken it down into individual entity services and then sat on top of those well now processing services with orchestration services. Just um, imp ju just implement this this here. Just do it. It's it's gonna fix your problem. And if this works for the invoice, try it for the for the rebate. And if it works for the rebate, try it for the offer. And if it works for the offer, try it for whatever else you have out there. This mm -hmm. solves your problem. I think probably then the, the trick is I've got all the right pieces. They're probably just not in the right places at the moment. You're going to have to rewrite your processing services because you built them as orchestration. Uh, yeah, I think at the moment but I've You got... could just rename them, but you still need a processing service though. Yeah, I think because we added an extra layer in, didn't we? Yeah. So I've got I've got logic that lives in my orchestration service that's partially processing service logic. Do, do, do you know how I know? Let, let me tell you how I know. Because your orchestration service should just be delegating. But now you're delegating and processing. Right. So every class, Paul, should either do the work or delegate the work, but not both. That's fair. Yeah. That's the rule. That's Mr. David Polara El Salvador from Canada. He taught me this, and I kept it in my head for years and years. See, I also want you to understand something. Like a whole bunch of people who are really good at what they do. This guy never wrote one line in C Sharp. He loves jo uh, Scala, right, and Kotlin and stuff like that. But I don't care about how he materializes his thoughts. I care more Wait, you, about how he thinks. You use Scala? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, a lot. You never mentioned it. <laughs> if we can bring poor comprehension in Scala and C sharp, oh my god. Did I tell you about four comprehension before? Never heard of it. Pick this out. Oh, you're fucking with me. Okay, fine. You're joking <laughs> with me. I want you to do a demo. You can show so, people. So so in four comprehension it does this. Check this out. Let's say you have or it, you're you're really you literally write it like this and you go and say i want the student and this is your student's collection right and in this student's collection you're basically saying where right student student dot status equal equal enrolled <coughs> so far so good right okay Watch this. you're going and saying give me all the students that are enrolled in the student class, right? And then you go down here by one and do this. Courses. You go and say courses dot where course. Course dot uh, course. Uh, let, let's say C for now, just for the brevity. Course dot attendance. ID equal equal student dot ID. Okay. So you're iterating over multiple collections. And then you go at the very end and say yield student courses. It's, it's ridiculous. It's beautiful. And there is no semicolons. Scala doesn't care about that. I can imagine how I would do that in link, but that is quite elegant syntax. It's beautiful. And it also, yeah. we, we introduced recently records. Like in C Sharp, you can go and say public record student. And then you can say string name and int age, right? Something like this, right? Scala had this for years. Scala does this class student uh, name string uh, age. In, and that's your entire class. Scala is what Java should have been, but it's functional Java, basically. Hmm. It's beautiful. Well, we've got records already, haven't we? Um, yeah, that's just very well, recent. When I saw records, I, I was dancing. Like we, we took three things from Scala and C Sharp that are amazing. Uh, uh, pattern matching, that's a Scala thing. That's functional programming language. And records, and I'm hoping that at some point in time we get for comprehension. You Watch, could write simple extension methods that did that, right? 
I mean this this is a this is a native keyword in the in the language itself. Yeah, yeah. It's not going to help you a lot. Anyway, before that, let's just go back to to this. Give this a shot. And and let's uh, let's benchmark it and let's really send heavy heavy stuff to it. Yeah, curious to see how far we could hit it. Um, because don't don't the, do the other four, just this one. Just that one, and just try and pump transactions through it on mass, essentially. So invoice line and invoice reference, and then you have in here invoice company, right? Uh, what yeah. what else other than company? So we've got the okay. header, the lines, the companies, the references. The ref um, and the what we, we do, we, com we compute the buckets, which is where the invoices live. We didn't really cover the buckets, but yeah. You can, you can do that here as well if you want. And then depending on the operation that takes place, we may audit the, uh, the operation. Sure. So that will add an, an item to the audit trail. Um, sure. And throw that but in. Yeah, I can see how all the pieces would would technically fit together. But you get it, right? You get the you're gonna you're gonna run into a very interesting problem, but I, I won't tell you now. I'll let you kind of figure out on your own. So up to the orchestration level, we're now at a point where the architecture is essentially flat. You're not scaling. One, yeah, for a single entity type, all the way up to the orchestration level, where um, the dependencies are only the the processing service for that entity type and the event service for that entity type and then the way that i'm linking or if you like traversing the events down the stack is to essentially have at the header level that queuing you publish, through eventing yep. and um, then listen push them listen. down into yep. all of the orchestration services so okay. it's the orchestration service that's subscribing and the event handler that it passes down is going to be an event handler that says, and when this happens, I'm going to orchestrate by calling my processing service dependencies. Yes. All right. I'll put something to that effect together and then we'll see what magic happens. If, if, okay. you, if you we should... do, um, if we do a follow on session, um, what we can do is we can actually go through what I've written in that follow on session and see how that, clicks with you um no doubt you'll probably go right you got it all wrong you didn't understand a word that i said and then we'll <laughs> this is this is what your this is what your listening would look like see that listen to student event if you dig deeper into that yeah, yeah. and then dig a little bit deeper into that you're gonna come to this that makes sense and there is nothing in the world today that is better than this reference at this moment in time because I haven't written anything about it in the standard yet. <laughs> by the way, when I have a working example of it, right? Yes. By the way, the standard as it stands today is just a bunch of placeholders. And I'm sorry to tell people that, but the, the, what I want to say versus what's there already is just 10%. It, it is funny because like when people talk about like patterns and practices um people get really like like for example if you talk to um the object orientation people right mm -hmm. they'll say like a whole application should just be at the root level a whole bunch of news and then you call some top level method and everything just magically happens right mm -hmm. but then there are people like from the the procedural world and they say oh yeah but everything should be a whole you know stack of procedure or tree of procedures effectively and then you've got like the functional guys, you know, and they're, they're talking about the way that you should funk, you know, everything should be sort of function trees, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then I sort of look at that and I go, well, actually, the real problems that we're solving here, you should use the, the right technology or the right um, pattern or practice for the problem that you're solving. There's no one rule, you know. It's not Lord of the Rings. There isn't one ring that you can wrap around yep. the wall and it, yep. it answers every problem. Yep. The key thing with what you're doing here is you're basically saying, hey, there's, there's a pattern here and things won't necessarily fit the way that you expect them to fit. But the whole yep. idea is to allow for some flexibility so that when you hit a problem, you've got somewhere to put the answer to that problem. Yeah. And what I've been trying to do is kind of establish, OK, there's a few fundamental problems that I have with my existing architecture because I used what you know most people would perceive as standard end here. Right. 
So we have a controller, a service, um, some sort of data context or broker, and then the database. Yep. I did that. And I've effectively got what you've got with the standard, but I used um, inheritance in my services. So my invoice service sits on top of a transaction service type as an inherited dependency. Yep. Now, the net result of that is, of course, it achieves the same logical result in terms of what it's producing, right? And in terms of the business logic that I'm executing, the problem is, and the reason for the grin on your face is that, yeah, ultimately what you've got is a microservice that's behaving like a monolithic service. <laughs> and th there's some inherent, like, when I tip a request into the invoice service, that thing that's tipped in on face value seems like a relatively trivial because it's just one method call, right? And the controller logic is literally a one-liner that's saying, yeah, call this. But then behind that is this whole stack of complication that's ultimately built into that one single object. And so by taking kind of like the standard approach, we're saying, well, what are the component parts that make up that? What is that inheritance hierarchy? And let's break the inheritance. Uh, instead of putting, you know, this derives from that, let's just say this depends on that. Yeah. Because then those pieces of the puzzle can be individually unit tested. And I was looking at the architecture that I've got when I come across what you're doing. And I was just like, this is ridiculous. Like, it's, <laughs> the, the key thing here is that, that conceptually, we're solving the problem. It doesn't matter how it's documented. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter like how complete it is. Mm -hmm. It matters that as a developer, we have the ability to kind of progress and improve things. Because if, if you're in a situation where you've got regression um, or some piece of your puzzle is just not going to work, then the pattern isn't going to fit. But if it's flexible, then that's how you get followers and that's how you get people interested in things. And this is how things like object orientation and functional programming and you know, certain languages and technologies take off, isn't it? Is yeah. you're, you're actually solving a problem. You're not generating new ones. Yeah. You're saying, hey, you, you see this issue that you've got? That goes away if you do this. Yeah. But if as a side effect of that, you have this but, <laughs> <laughs> straight away, people are going to be like, Nah. Right. If you, if you can look at that and you can say, well, you will have a but, but in the situation where you have that but, there's a but on the but that allows you to say, <laughs> nah, because it, I can already handle that. There's a place for that to go. It, it, you know, it, yeah. if, if you face your problem, there is a way to work around it. And that's all that people care about because programmers at the end of the day, the yeah. bulk of our industry are Stack Overflow developers. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> to coin the common term, right? Yep. The majority of programmers out there are like, oh, problem, right? Google, Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow, yeah. How do I do X? Oh, code okay. sample, copy, paste. Pff, it didn't go bang. Yeah. Commit. You know, have, don't care yeah. about it. It's a QA problem. Oh, QA rejected it. Whoops. <laughs> You know, just, it, just because, just because some, this is what I try to tell a lot of people. Just because some code works, it doesn't mean that it's right. Yeah. It, in fact, actually, just because some code works today, it doesn't mean that's going to work tomorrow. This is why it's really important for that code to be right. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I always tell people as well is like, you know, when, when I join a company, um, quite often they'll give me like their two gig code base and I'll look at that and I'll be like, okay, fine. We need to throw a gigabyte of this away. And everybody <laughs> looks at me like I'm talking some foreign language. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I get that my American ish is not perfect, but hear me out here, right? <laughs> um, most code bases have technical debt, they have, you know, legacy aspects about them and they they have like no consistent patterning to them, right? So mm -hmm. what you end up inheriting ultimately when you join these projects is just like a mass of code that, and when you say to people, oh, you can't architect code like that, you need to follow a decent um, process or pattern for things. And it's important, right? Because if you do, you'll have half as much code, which is ultimately what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. They then go, yeah, but that's not possible because how do you handle 
and they come up with some arbitrary complex scenario that the code base doesn't even currently solve, right? And then it's like, well, if your current code base doesn't solve it, why mm -hmm. do you expect me to solve that in the new code base that would be mm -hmm. just better written? Mm -hmm. But ultimately, actually, half the time I've sat down and I've gone, well, this is how you would do it. Because if something is architecturally better, you can then look at that and go, well, in this architecture, this is where I would put the thing. <laughs> no brainer, right? And then they look at you like... <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, it's it's so amazing how many like <laughs> you know, senior devs are like, oh, I've been in this industry for 20 years. You can't tell me how to write code. And I'm, I'm not telling you how to write code. I'm just saying, if you write code well, you won't have complicated code is, is the bottom line, right? Like when I look at a lot of um, particularly like your code or code that I consider to be well written, the bulk of the code, I look at it and I go, this code isn't doing anything. How does it actually achieve anything? But actually, when you follow the call chains yeah. down, you start yeah. to realize that there's inherently. Yep. Um, and the, the common phrase that I like to come back to is Conway's game, game of life. Have you heard of Conway's game of life? Yep, 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 yep. yep. Four very simple rules. Yep. And out of that, the things that people have produced on YouTube as videos of Conway at scale, running on a GPU, for example, literally four rules. <laughs> like, I mean... Let me, let me bring it up, Paul, so I, yeah, yeah. I can show it to you. Conway. <laughs> Conway's oh, game oh. of life. Yeah. yeah. Um, but if you... You know, and that's that's complexity out of just literally four rules. I mean, yeah. how many business rules go look, into enterprise look, look, systems? Look at what Google search is doing. Look, look, do you see it? Do you see what Google wow. search is doing? <laughs> wow, <laughs> that is brilliant. So, so, so let's see. Rules, uh, there, yeah, there it is. Conway's game of life. Uh, origins pattern. There it is. Any live cell with fewer than two live neighbors dies, as if by underpopulation. So this is based on the concept that you have a grid of cells, and think of it as binary, right? They're either switched mm -hmm. on or they're off, mm -hmm. and by on or off we mean they're either alive or dead. Mm -hmm. And so these are the four rules that describe when a cell should be alive or dead in the next iteration, when you iterate mm -hmm. over your cell grid. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Any any live cell with two or three live neighbors uh, live, lives on to the next iteration. Any live cell with more than three live neighbors dies as if by overpopulation. Any dead cell with exactly three live neighbors becomes a live cell as if by reproduction. <laughs> yeah. Dead simple, right? Four that's, rules. That, that's not what I thought. I think I was I was thinking something else in my head. It's also Conway who said any organization developing systems will eventually produce systems that match and resemble the exact same communication structure for these organizations. I think I think it's Conway, you know. Mm -hmm. But um Oh, that's 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 not what I thought at all. I actually never heard of those. Thanks for this. Mm. Uh, it, it, you know, it's and it's. I, I kind of looked at it, and and Conway was first and foremost a mathematician, and mm -hmm. so he's looking at things from a mathematician's point of view. But mm -hmm. as programmers, you know, I often another thing that I often like to point out to people is computers do not do math. Yeah. Do not go thinking that computers do math. They don't. <laughs> they do logic, which yeah. as as I see it, and, and I've had debates with mathematicians about this, about the relationship between logic and math. Yeah. Now, now my understanding is that all math has to be logical, but yeah. not all logic has to be mathematical. That's true. Yeah. So fundamentally, what we should be saying is that logic is a subset of math, right? Um, but because all math is logical, we say that actually math is a subset of logic. It's not. And there's this there's this weird relationship, right? So, like, you come across the infinity symbol. Yeah. What does a computer do with that? Because it cannot represent that. It, it, you can't do math with infinity that's, on that's, a computer. 
it's ac it's actually an amazing ex i really like that you brought that up because mathematicians will tell you infinity is not a number <laughs> Lo logic will tell you can you apply arithmetic operations to it therefore it's a number yeah and, and this is where things get weird so you know <laughs> and the common example is i think it's what was it uh, one one divided by three you, do, you give that to a computer and ultimately that last byte or that last bit is oh. is always wrong yeah is always wrong because floating point right yes <laughs> rounding errors they're a thing because math deals with absolutes and logic just simply doesn't right yeah. so we we deal with the things that we we can handle you know we we can't handle absolute precision because of the limit problem yes sir so, yeah it, it, you know I'm, i feel like i've rabbit holed a little bit here but the bottom I, line here is that I, when I, people I, get I, uh, I hope this was useful. You figured out something out of this. I yeah. enjoy talking to you, Paul. You know, I, I remember I only spend that much time with people when I'm pairing, like going back and forth. Normally in a in a in a light meeting day, the second four hours of the day, I'm just sitting down with someone and pairing with them from 1 p.m. until four o'clock and maybe an hour before that. But um I hope you have some answers at least, like something to look at. I promise you it'll work. Maybe, maybe I've gone through this before. I think the next step now is for me to go away and, and actually write some code right. and, and potentially go back and read some of your code. Do, do, <laughs> do a POC of what we just did. Yeah. And if it works for you, I will help you write it. We will write it together. We will yeah, there's going to be a few um, pieces about it that... I just don't want to face the challenge of at the moment. So I've got bits like um, you talk about having entities as anemic objects. So there's no functionality in them. Yeah. Um, I've got like a user object, which I do my security checks on. So I have a can method. So I can say user.can, and I can pass in the privilege, and I can additionally pass in the object, which is the scope in which that operation is allowed. Build a user service like a normal person. God damn it. Because then if I add that into this, it yeah. would be another dependency. So what? So what? Do you it's, want? It's just more complication. Okay, let me ask you something. We can write your entire program in one file. In the name of list complication. <laughs> you know, you know when I was talking to Eagle Hansen, you know he's he's the guy that wrote the B unit, the test the testing library for Blazor. You know what he said to me? He said to me, Hassan, I strongly don't agree with a lot of things you do, but there is something I will respect about you. You're staying consistent. You're staying truly yeah. consistent. If you stay consistent, no matter how long ago your code is, anybody can pick it up and write it. If you break your own rules, nobody's going to follow it. You're not, you won't be able to scale. I'm telling you. But, but how do you address that? Like the flip side of that is, I've never written a line of code, and I think many developers um, agree with this. Where six months later, say, I've gone back to it and I've gone, that line of code is perfect. There's nothing about it I would change. Like if if you're doing that on a regular basis, I would say you're not learning anything, right? Yeah, but but that's the thing when you when you change your line of code. You're changing it because your whole pattern of thinking have changed and you grew according to the standard instead of that you written line of code that you cut a, a quick corner until something is done and now you have to go back to it. When you write code according to the standard, there's no tick debt. The tick debt curve. If you're, saying, if you're saying all your code is to the standard and therefore it's correct, if in six months' time it's still absolutely correct, then I would say the, the standard hasn't evolved, and therefore you've not learned anything. It, it, it's not. This whole vertical, the, the vertical cul-de-sac at scale, hmm. that changes Smooth. everything, right? Hmm. But, but you have to know when that change needs to happen in my code, it's not that one line. It's across all services because they're consistent. 
Yeah, class explosion. That was another issue I raised with you behind the scenes. So I've right. gone from having like, yeah. you know, one invoice service, which depends on a stack of three or four classes to now having, well, I guess every box in my diagram now is going to be a class. And that's okay. So. You can either do it this way or you could try to be smart and build on generics and hit a brick wall exactly where you don't need it to, to happen. <laughs> What's wrong with generics, man? Everybody wants to pass 10 generic parameters into everything, right? I mean, that's totally the way that you should use generics, of course. <laughs> two, 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 things that, two things that tell me someone is about to hit a brick wall. Number one, they're Lots using they're, they're abusing generics. Number, <laughs> I use generics too, but I use them very cautiously. Number two, they have more than one layer of inheritance. This is immediately when I know, yeah, that person is about... I worked in a company some 10 years ago, man, where they had at least nine levels of inheritance. Yikes. And when I asked, I asked the dude, I said to him, my dude, uh, why? And he said to me, I have this astronaut mindset where I can be in a spaceship and click one button and everything will happen on Earth because of inheritance. Like the buildings will get built, the... The, the the food will get cooked the 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 schools will get open because it's all inheriting all the way up to that hierarchy and i said to him, we we ought to send you on a spaceship on a no return ticket you know just to save humanity from your brain you know <laughs> he, he was he was a good guy though he was he was all right but uh you know i i disagreed with him strongly you know here's what i like about all of this you know you get to try it Try the standard. Whatever the outcome out of you trying this is beneficial to me. And this is selfish, but it's very beneficial to me. It either works, so it will confirm, you know, and affirm the the theories. And I have a strong feeling that it would work because I'm not pulling this out of my ass. I actually tried it out in different places. Or, <laughs> or if it doesn't work, then I need to evolve. Hmm. So either way, I'm either so you want learning... me to try out your theory. <laughs> so when it goes sideways, you can go, okay, already... let's try again. I mean, to be honest with you, I'm already adapting it in Git file. Like I was just having our stand up meeting with my team. And I said, okay, you know, one of the folks said, hey, we need to adapt. I said, okay, all our write operations, sorry, all, all our compute. So Git file, let me just explain to you. You know what Git file is, I hope, at some point. Yeah, yeah. It looks at yeah. your code and it tells you who you are. It's just that simple. So if Paul is spending more time and bringing more value to the business through his code, even if he doesn't know how to speak for himself, Git file speaks for you. That's how your rewards should be measured. And then it also has other social aspects that I'll talk about that later. But you know, the idea with Git file, Git file goes through three main stages. There is the it, you know, gathering process where it goes and looks at your code and analyzes your code and all that. So it pulls out your code and your commits. And then it throws away all that information because it transforms that into analysis. So that's the comp that's the persistence process. So there's gathering, persistence, and then computation and visualization. So it computes your profile and then it exposes it to the outside world. This entire compute component, I said to my team, we're going to rewrite all of it according to the cul de sac vertical scale. And they said, but we don't know if it works. I said, that's exactly why we're going to do it. Hmm. How this works, though, is that you make a pull request. You're sending a pull request, right? Your pull requests have some data in it that people don't usually look at. Commit history, right? There's a bunch of commits, right? I pick that up and I say, okay, go put records for all the people that contributed to this pull request. Go put scores. Go update the rank. Go update the, you know, the uh, the performance of this person based on the average time they take to complete a certain feature. This is exactly that scenario that you're doing here, except except that is like nine other services subscribe to the same event. Hmm. What's so are it? you um, are you microservice spreading the load across multiple applications then? 
to figure out the, the various pieces, essentially. Yep. So you actually do need service bus in the middle, yep. whereas I can do all of this stuff in heavily. Memory, so. If you look, if you look at my Git file code, let me show you. I'll show you something real quick. It's it's not a public project. It's just but, restables, right? But I, but I own the damn company, so I may as well share my own code if I want to. <laughs> and and I don't have it. I don't have investors because I'm rich enough to fund my own projects. So I don't need some MBA clown coming in and telling me how to build my company. Well, if you're giving away money, um, I've got a bank account. Okay, perfect. Love it. No worries. Yeah, just Love anytime. It. Love you know, it. That's, that's... You, you just give me a shout, man. I'll, I'll be willing to help you out. Check check this out. Check this out. <laughs> so do you see? Do you see this broker? This Q broker. It picks up profiles, repository. You're gonna add opportunities and whatever, and it immediately goes and publishes to another microservice that has the listening part of this. Wait, you're, you're, you're publishing events to another. Broker? Yeah, to another no to, to no to Azure Service Bus where another microservice will be listening. Oh, so this is a queue talking to a queue. Yeah. Is is that allowed within the standard? Yeah, of course. It's not it's not a queue talking to a queue. This is a queue that's that's allowing you to in queue messages, and then there is another broker sitting on the other microservice that's listening. Okay. L let me visualize this for you here. If you go into where is design and architecture, trans, da, 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 proposing, modeling, yeah, here, here it is. This is our actual core implementation. If you look at this, this guy here basically goes and says, where is it? No, that's that's that, that's that. There it is. That's an example. So the request, a new pull request gets merged. It goes and pulls your profile information from here. Sees if there is any changes have happened here. And then it publishes to a queue. And then a queue picks it up. Another microservice picks it up and processes it. Oh, yeah. See how easy this is? It's cute. It's simple. It just works. <laughs> right? And and every every service has its own implementation. Like if you look at actual... Where is it? Where is the? This is here my right part. Look how it looks like. But guess what? I can pick up. I can pick you up today and drop you on this project, and you'll be able to write code from day one. Yeah, of course, because I I get where you're going with it, right? Why? Because it's freaking simple. Yeah. This is one of the big tests, actually. Like, if if you join a new company as a developer, and let's say you got I don't know twenty years behind your belt, right? Mm -hmm. Um. Behind your belt, under your belt, under your belt is the common expression. Yeah. Um, so you now, got... you're, now you're just making up English words. Go ahead. I'm yeah, just... <laughs> yeah. It's how I, that's how the language works, right? I make something up tomorrow. It'll appear in, in the Oxford Dictionary. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah. What, you, you what, 20... what, what do you guys say? <laughs> Bingo babies. <laughs> what? What do you say? Dingo babies? What do you say? <laughs> no idea. Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> Are you on about dingleberries? I don't know. <laughs> Go ahead. Just listen. It, it was famous when I think it was the PM said something or called somebody a cockwomble or something in Parliament, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. My favorite British word, boofhead. <laughs> boofhead. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if it's British or Australian. I get them mixed up. You know, I need to chill out about that one. But so I heard Boofhead a while back and I was like, Boofhead? That sounds amazing. Somebody needs to tell me exactly what that means. You know? <laughs> I have no idea. I've lost track. I only know Americanish these days. <laughs> <laughs> so so tell me, Paul, in, in England, do people say no caps? No caps. So, so this is like Gen Z kind of language. Be like, oh, he clapped back. He clapped back, meaning that he responded to an accusation or, or an attack verbally. Or that's not English, by the way. That's American-ish, truly. And, oh, they say, <laughs> oh, bro, no caps. No caps, meaning no exaggeration. This is for real. Or 
they, they go, other people or people would go and say <laughs> I'm, I'm say, just not street enough for this conversation. Yeah, this is super street <laughs> pop. Like I know people who have lived their whole life in here be like, that's not, I don't know what you're saying. That's like Gen Z youngsters kind of thing. You know, my, the new one is like sus. That's totally sus. Sus, mm-hmm. like suspect, suspicious. <laughs> oh, people from like Bristol area, they're, they're always saying like in it. In it. Yeah, in it. I got it, in it. It's good, bro, in it. <laughs> or, or, or like, yeah, yeah, it's a shame, in it. In it. Like, <laughs> what, what does that even mean? In it. And, and they just, like, slap it on the end of any sentence. In it. <laughs> okay, yeah, but what are you saying? In it. <laughs> in it. I'm like, what, are you trying to initialize a new object? What? <laughs> I, I have I have a buddy of mine who likes to say, you know what? And then I did this and that, you know what? And then I was going there, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> or you know what I'm saying, or you know, stuff like that. Anyway. Well, <clears throat> it's been a pleasure hanging out with you today, sir. I better shove some food in my face before it's uh it, the sun goes up. But uh I, I appreciate your time. I hope you found this useful. Uh, this is this is almost my longest YouTube video by far, but uh, I'm hoping that people kind of get something out of it. You know, someone told me the other day, I play your YouTube videos in my car while I'm driving. I'm like, that's not a good idea. It's like, I don't care what you're really showing. I just want to hear what you're trying to kind of accomplish. And then later on, I'll see what's in the I, I thought that was pretty cool. I also have have a friend of mine who doesn't know programming. He does, he's not interested in programming, but he says, I watch your videos to know that you're okay. That's funny. <laughs> just funny. looking out for you, bro. <laughs> yeah, just, just making sure you're you're okay, you're not busy. Nice. Thank you so much, Paul. We'll talk later, okay, man? Cool, yeah, you. Cheers for your time, man. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.